Yep. Yeah. Click on your <laughs> and then hit apply to maximize it. And then if you needed to, um, you can advance it by down, or you can use this. Gotcha. So advance is the right, back is the left. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Right. I know we ain't. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. Something's going to have to give. I, I, you know, I have to get up and more at that point, the I see. He's uh, right behind you. That's one thing you know. You know. Is that more? Is that the, is that what you just did? Absolutely. <laughs> but I'm, this is my yeah, favorite. Yeah. Mm. And somebody brought it in. Hey, Cedric. It's <laughs> right here. <laughs> How many people were missing today? Who handed this to us? To the clerk. Basically, <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the Durham Planning Commission meeting. Just so you know, the members of the Planning Commission have been appointed by the governing bodies, half of us by the City Council, half by the Board of County Commissioners. So you should know that the elected officials have the final say on any of the matters that are before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, and you probably saw we have a very packed agenda tonight, we invite you to sign up on my left. You can see the table. There's a piece of paper for each of the agenda items. So please make sure you're signing up for the particular item that you would like to speak on, and you can put down your name and your address. Let us know if you're speaking for or against. And each side during the public hearing on that particular item will have 10 minutes per side. When you come up, when we call your name, we ask you to come up to the podium and speak into the microphone. Let us know your name, your, your home address, and then you'll have time to speak. Uh, finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. So thanks again for joining us. May we have the roll call, please? Um, Commissioner Williams has requested an excused absence. Um, Commissioner Morgan will be arriving later. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Bryan? Present. Commissioner Durkin? Present. Commissioner Alturk? Present. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Commissioner Busby? Present. Commissioner Miller? Present. Commissioner Kinchin? Present. Um, Ms. Satterfield, I I'm making sure everybody got the email earlier today. Ms. Satterfield has resigned. So. Uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. Commissioner Baker has requested an excused absence. And uh, Commissioner Gibbs? Present. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Bryan? Uh, Move an excused absence for Commissioners Baker and Williams. Second. Properly moved and seconded by, moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much.
We will move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statements from our January 3rd, 2019 meeting, as well as our January 8th, 2019 meeting. Let's, let's do those as two separate motions. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, this is in reference to the revised draft that came out this afternoon for January 3rd, but I move approval of the minutes and consistency statements from the January 3rd meeting as presented. Second. A properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the January 8th consistency statement and minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move approval of the minutes and consistency statements from the January 8th meeting as presented. Second. A moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Um, staff does not have any adjustments at this time, but we would like to state for the record that all um, public notice uh, requirements have been met for state and local ordinance and are on file in the planning department. Affidavits actually are on file. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let's have a, do we need a motion for tonight's agenda? I move we adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryant, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. We will move to our first item. This is a public hearing on a comprehensive plan future land use map amendment with a concurrent zoning map change. This is 1309 Junction Road cases A18 quadruple zero six and Z18 triple zero one seven. And we will start, thank you. We'll start with the staff report and then we'll open the public hearing. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the planning department and I will be presenting case number A180006Z180101. Z180001. 1309 Junction Road. <clears throat> the applicant is Pam Porter from Tony M. Tate, PA. The site is located at 1309 Junction Road. It is located within the city um, pending an annexation application. The site in total is 33.31 acres. The zoning request is rural residential to plan development residential 2.702, PDR 2.702. In addition, there is a future land use map amendment from industrial to low density residential which is four dwelling units or acre or less. And the proposal is for a maximum of 90 single family residential units. Um, and um, as mentioned, there's a voluntary annexation petition also submitted as part of this request. This is the aerial map and the subject site is shown in red. The property is located within the suburban development tier, the Noose River uh, Basin, the Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay, District B, and a portion of the property is um, within the Major Transportation Corridor, I-85 Overlay District. Um, the 33-acre parcel consists of vacant, undeveloped land, including areas of streams, associated riparian buffers, wetlands, immature pines, and hardwoods. Um, these uh, pictures, um, show the existing site and some of the surroundings. Most of the properties bordering the, prop the site are residential development. However, there is an industrially zoned piece of land which is owned by Durham County to the south. This is the zoning context map. As shown on the left, the site is presently zoned um, rural residential and the applicant proposes to change this uh, designation to um, the blue shade, which is the planned um, uh, plan development residential 2.702 density. And here is the future land use map as shown on the left. The property is within the industrial designation and on the right, it's shown in the low density residential, which would coincide with the rezoning request. <clears throat> the proposed conditions map uh, provides the site access points, the project boundary buffers, 
the riparian crossings, the um, building and parking envelopes, um, the tree coverage areas, and the maximum impervious coverage. In terms of a summary of key committed elements on the plan, the permitted housing type is single family detached residential along with permitted accessory uses within the zoning district. The maximum impervious coverage will not exceed um, 70%. Uh, they have um, committed to installing some transportation related improvements, including um, a left turn lane on Farrell Road at the proposed site entrance and additional asphalt to accommodate a future bicycle lane. In addition to the text commitments um, and the graphic commitments already discussed, the development plan also includes um, a couple design commitments for the roof styles and a variety of different building materials. In terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan and its um, policies, the proposed PDR zoning designation does not comply with the current industrial designation on the future land use map. The low density residential um, designation um, for the track is consistent with the neighboring land and farms planned residential development to the west um, and is an acceptable designation in the suburban tier in accordance with 213D. The proposed low density um, designation is consistent with the planned development, residential development permissible within the suburban tier. Um, and it sh we should note while industrial uses are also allowed within the suburban tier, um, staff has reviewed the industrial land study and determined that this property is not a prime industrial site, um, especially given its proximity to an existing residential subdivision. The proposal supports orderly development patterns as per policy 231A in that the site is surrounded um, by planned development residential 3.360 to the west, um, rural residential to the north and east, and um, there is existing infrastructure such as roads and water, sewer uh, to accommodate the potential impacts. The proposed development is consistent with 812H. While the traffic from the proposed zoning will increase, the applicant will install ex uh, exclusive westbound turn lane on Farrell Road at the site entrance. And in terms of 814D, uh, the development plan commits to additional asphalt for the future bicycle lane, and the uh, proposed development is consistent with 11.11B. There is sufficient capacity within the school system to accommodate the additional growth. <laughs> Staff determines that this request, these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sanyak. We will open the public hearing, and we have one individual who has signed up, and they're speaking for the proposal, Pamela Porter. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Pam Porter, 5011 South Park Drive. Um, I'm the applicant on this for the landscape architecture firm that helped to put together the development plan, so I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Great, thank you. Thanks. Is anyone else who would like to speak on this item? So I'm not seeing anyone, so I will close the public hearing. And commissioners, any questions or comments? We'll start to my right, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, uh, quick question for Mrs. Porter um, regarding the request. So am I correct in that the maximum number of units, single family residential units will be 90 units? Correct, yes. And so for staff, I was just noting that on the attachment seven, the description of the, the commitments does not include the 90, the number 90 units on that. And then I didn't see it on the actual, um, site plan here, so I was just noting that when I, when I was seeing it in the text, but not in the, the um, on the written text commitments in the, in the site plan. 
So Jamie Sanyak with the planning department. So if you calculate out the acreage times the proposed PDR density, that's the maximum that you would get. Okay. That's good enough for you all. Okay. And I'm just curious, do you have a sense of what the price range would be for these single family resident, uh, residential units? Yes. Um, you have my notes. The average price will be approximately $275,000. That's the average, so it could be a little more, it could be a little less. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan? Um, I also have a question. Uh, on the development plan sheet D1, uh, I noticed that there was a feature A, which seems to be pointing at a stream in the wetlands, and a feature C, also pointing at a stream in wetlands, and the note says, see the NCDWG letter. We don't have that letter in our packet. Uh, can you tell, what does it say? Sure, so it was submitted to staff when we submitted the development plan, and it's just a stream determination letter, and it shows the determination of um, what streams have buffers on them and what do not. So sometimes there is a stream present, but it's not, a buffered stream. Okay. So we, as you can see, there's our there's a couple yeah. buffered streams, but there's a couple that are not. Okay. And the problem with the entrance off of Farrell Road, where you have more room, I think, to make an entrance, is that you do have to cross one of these buffered streams and wetlands. And I'm wondering, did you give any thought to coming in off of Junction Road? We did. Um, as we have been developing the, the layout for the site, nothing's been finalized, but it was um, making the connection to Farrell logistically made more sense based on the working layout that we have. And we're also um, preserving trees where, where that connection to Junction Road may have been made. We've elected to save that as tree save. It made more sense to have it there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Miller? Yeah, so I had the same question. I'd like to follow up on it a little bit. It, this was a difficult property to go look at because as big as it is, it doesn't present much yeah. view from the street. Uh, it seems to me that it would be desirable to be able to enter this property from uh, Farrell Road and Junction Road, or maybe preferable from Junction Road because then you don't have to cross a buffered street. Uh, so... I listened to what uh, your conversation with George, and I, I, I get it, but I, it still seems to me that uh, that it, would, it might be better to ha be able to get into this piece of property uh, more than one way. Um, however, I know that because it's 90 units, it, that doesn't trigger the two entrance. Is that right, staff? <coughs> And the question for staff is the number of units, does it, 90 units does not trigger to... So it's got to be more than 90. No. It would have to be more than 90 to have more than one access point. Exactly. If you have. That was my question. I'm sorry. I, um, I also wanted to ask staff, too, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe even three, there was a proposal by the county in this area to, to do a rezoning or some sort of development. Was that near this piece of property? There was one. There was one. I was asking Scott because I think it was right around the time he and I switched jobs. Yeah, it was south of this site. But it was not too far away. No, it's not far. It's just it's down. Adjacent. It's actually, yeah, it's adjacent. Yeah. I adjacent. And what became of that? It's still vacant. They've not, they've not. Found a development. No, but the county's proposal to create like an industrial park or something in there. Hi, this is Scott Wade from the Planning Department. Um, what we understand from the county, they've they're not moving forward with that project. Okay, because you still the, own the land. That's the parcel that on the development plan has the two large access arrows. That's correct. All right. Let me check my notes very really quickly. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Durkin? I had a question on the development plan, page D2. You have the potential site access two and three, but what does that really provide access to if the county owns that land and there's not a public street or any access point to the same to the south? Sure, so as we're working through the layout for the site, there's a links to nodes requirement in the UDO that you have to have a certain number of stubs or connections to the surrounding properties. And as we're working through the, the plan, we're wanting options to meet that requirement and if we may need to have the, the stubs to the property. Okay, so just the stub, you're not. Correct, so they're not required, but we're okay. just leaving our options open in case we do need to utilize it. And we've had conversations with staff and they said to show it on this just in case we do need to make those connections and call it out as, as optional. And you have a potential future wetland crossing in the middle, this arrow is on either end. What do you ex what do you anticipate that looking like? What do you mean by that? It would be a street connection to um, cross from the from the north to the south part of the project. We're still working on the, the the exact layout of so that road may shift a little bit and we may be able to pull it out of the wetlands. So it's not it's not set in stone, but we wanted to show it on there in case we did need to make that connection and it crossed the wetlands. Okay. And I just have a question for staff about the industrial land use study and just timing on that since we had a similar question of changing industrial use to residential recently. So the we did complete one in 2013, a few years ago, um, and we are currently working on one that would be more expansive and it will probably be finished around June okay. of this year. Thanks. That was it. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? And if there are none, this is the appropriate time for a motion. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, I pass. All right. Great. Commissioner Miller? For this for staff, uh, if the property were remained zoned as it is today, how how many units could you get on it, just roughly? Or, or what is the residential density for RR? And you don't have to answer the, the, the original question. Amy Sanyak with the Planning Department. I'm going to refer to attachment six, and um, it's calculated to be roughly 38 single family lots under the current zoning. Any additional questions, Commissioner Miller? That's all, thank you, that helps. So this is the appropriate time for a motion. I'll recognize any commissioner that is prepared to make a motion for right again. approval. Commissioner Al Turk. Um, I move that we send case A180006 to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. That's moved by Commissioner Al Turk and seconded by Commissioner Brine. Staff would prefer a roll call vote? Sure, if you, don't, if you would indulge us. I, I, we will indulge. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Okay. Um, Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Brine? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kanchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Okay, uh, motion passes 9-1. And uh, the zoning? I move that we send case Z1800017 to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Al Turk and seconded by Vice Chair Hyman. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner, Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. The motion passes nine to one. Thank you very much. We will now move, we have three zoning map cases in front of us. The first case is the King's Daughters Inn, and this was continued from our January 3rd meeting. This is case Z18-00024, and we will start with the staff report. 
Good evening. Uh, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Since case Z180024, King's Daughter Inn has been continued from January 3rd meeting and no changes have been made to the application. Um, staff is available for any questions. Um, please let me know if you'd like me to repeat the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you. I am not seeing anyone asking for repeating the PowerPoint. So we will move to the public hearing. Thank you. So we'll open the public hearing. We have one individual signed up to speak and to speak for the project. It's uh, Deanna Crossman. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Deanna Crossman, 301 South Academy Street in Cary. Um, let me just, so just, I'll be brief. I just wanted to kind of highlight a few things about the project. So this is a request to rezone um, the King's Daughters Inn from partly RUM, partly RU52 to all RUM. So the home operated for almost 100 years as a home for elderly. As a home for elderly indigent women. Uh, they had 34 rooms. We were the second owners of the property. We bought it and we actually applied the um, covenants on the deed as well as applied for the local landmark, historic landmark status once we bought the building because we felt very strongly about making sure the building was protected for the future. Uh, we have a minor use, special use permit to operate as a 17 room bed and breakfast in Trinity Park. We have no plans to convert the property to condos or apartments. Um, it is for sale and we just want to provide flexibility to a future owner. Um, the because of the protections of the covenants and the um, local landmark status, there's almost no modification you could make to the site plan and fit within those boundaries. Um, and if converted, it would allow uh, residential units, seven units from around 2,500 to 4,000 square feet. Um, so it would allow seven units by right. The site already has enough parking uh, with a previous concrete parking lot to meet that requirement. Staff report notes that it is a lower density than a bed and breakfast um, in terms of traffic utilities and water consumption because we want a pretty high occupancy. And we aren't asking for any exceptions to the design or uh, uh, density requirements. We um, did several uh, outreach to the neighbors. We, had, we hosted two meetings at the King's Daughters, uh, both December and in January. We listed it on the Trinity Park listserv. Um, we discussed with representatives of Duke. They had no concerns. Uh, in addition to the two open meetings we had at the hotel, we also attended the most recent Trinity Park Neighborhood Association monthly meeting uh, to make sure we were there to answer questions or discuss concerns and allowed for two uh, continuances since the first one was the snow. <laughs> and uh, there was a discussion last time about the covenants, the deed covenants. Uh, the Neighborhood Association is leading the pack in looking at transfer of ownership of those from the King's Daughters to either Preservation North Carolina, Preservation Durham, or um, the Neighborhood Association, the King's Daughters will actually be discussing that on March 25th. But this is kind of in parallel to that. Concerns, the, the primary concerns we heard from the neighbors, um, could it be turned into student housing? No, there is a covenant in the deed that actually prevents student housing. In addition, the price point doesn't really allow for, the market won't bear uh, dorms, you know, when you start at $5 million. Uh, can it be torn down? No, there's also a covenant that says it can't be torn down. And in addition, we did the local landmark um, protections. So we are currently 10 years into that. So if somebody did modify the exterior or want to tear it down, they would owe the 50% of the back taxes from the day we got the landmark status. So that's a pretty big number and growing every year. Uh, so that's a pretty hefty f financial uh, discouragement from affecting the outside of the building. And uh, our parent company is going through a chapter 11 restructuring that does not affect anything for sale operations. Um, everything is going as planned. So uh, just happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. We'll see if there's anyone else who wants to speak and close the public hearing, but we, we may call you back up. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing. Commissioners, we'll start to my right. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, I'll chop this up to him, agent. So I, was, I wasn't I was able to find any notes that I had. Is Was this continuation 
like done before. Did we have any public debate on this last time, or was it? What was the issue with it being continued? Right, and that's a good question. And and other commissioners should make sure I, I and staff I get this correct. So. This was originally on the December meeting, which was canceled due to the snowstorm. Right. On the January meeting, the Neighborhood Association had asked for additional time given the, the notice happening right before the holidays for their Neighborhood Association to be able to actually have time for their committee to meet. And the applicant was kind enough to agree to our request to, to uh, continue it. Sounds like those conversations have been able to happen based on this hearing this evening. Other, any, any other questions, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, I'm good, thanks. All right. Commissioner Miller? Yeah, actually, Mr. Alturk. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Alturk. Yeah. I just wanted to make a quick comment that I was at a Trinity Park meeting recently, last week or so, and, um, and everyone seemed supportive of, of doing this, so there was no opposition to this. So. Great, thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Miller? And Mr. Chairman, I wanted to follow up at when this came before us um, last time, I mentioned that I believe that um, that an organization of which I serve a leadership role uh, might have had an interest in this property. That was incorrect. Uh, as it turns out, the restricted, the, the restricted covenants are in favor of the former owner and not in favor of Preservation Durham. Um, I knew we had a file on it, and I knew it was considered, but they actually didn't. They, they went a different direction with those things. I did have a couple of questions for uh, Deanna, if that's okay. You may, and thank you for the clarification. Um, so, I don't want to get into your business too much, but since you mentioned, <clears throat> is this property subject to the, the bankruptcy? Yes. And so to sell it, you'll have to obtain the approval of the court? Yes. Or a trustee? I'm not sure what the nature of your bank is. it's us. Okay, very good. Uh, and I believe you said it could be seven units? Seven is what That seems about. small. The property in my mind is a large one. It's uh, about two-thirds of an acre, 0.63. No, I'm talking about the building itself. The building is 25,000 square feet. That's why they would be pretty significant size apartments. The attic apartment where I used to live is about 4,000 square feet. And then um, below the way it would divide easily actually kind of settles out to seven. That 1950s building would be one apartment per floor at 2,500 square feet. And then the original structure could be two per floor or two floors. And it happens to be seven would be allowed by right. So it kind of settles out pretty Nice. I know that nobody knows that building better than you do. Uh, is it practically feasible to convert it into seven residential? It's units? actually pretty easy, yes. Okay. The way we built it out with the hotel rooms, since there is so much plumbing and so many HVAC units, and there's, yes. And if it. this rezoning was not granted, how difficult would it be to, to find somebody else to run it as, as an inn like you have run it? Well, actually, I can tell you, um, of the buyers we have looking for it, the two uh, most likely candidates are actually looking to continue operations as a BNB. They just are also interested in the flexibility for the future. Um, it's a great building as is. It's just, you know, yeah. never know what's going to happen. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? Yeah. I just have a, a comment about McKean's Daughters Inn and the service that's been provided over the years to uh, patients and their families at Duke Medical Center and no telling where else, but that is something that means a lot to me uh, because I know how that situation is. Uh, but I just wanted to Thank you, your staff, uh, for providing that service. Uh, it's not free, but it's a greatly reduced price, but it's, uh, well, it's very much appreciated by those that have had to use it, and I'm sure people have come back for a good sure. time, too. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I mean, we it's really a wonderful enjoy the place. community. I've been in Durham for 17 years. We love being an asset, and I hope that it continues to be that asset. All my staff are there who want to stay at the King's Daughters. They are loyal to the King's Daughters, so we are hopeful that it will continue as a hotel. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. 
Uh, I also did just want to say thank you for your, your flexibility and patience. First, the Absolutely. act of God in December, and then the act of the Planning Commission in January. But <laughs> okay. it, it is appreciated. That's not a comparison. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> thank you. But, but it, it, it's always nice when we can take the time for the neighbors Definitely. to have input, and you've been really gracious, and it's, it, it has paid off, I think. So we, we appreciate, appreciate that. that. Yeah. I think it's an appropriate time for a motion for consideration of approval. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Oh, darn it. <clears throat> you may. Okay. Um, so, so. I move that uh, we send case Z18-00024 concerning the King's Daughters Inn forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Hyman? Yes. Uh, Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you. We'll move to our next item. This is the Odyssey Towns case. This is case Z18-00019. Thank you. We'll start with the staff report. Good evening, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case Z18-00019, Odyssey Towns. The applicant is Gary Wallace. This 26.85 acre site comprises three lots located at 3500 and 3614 NC 55 Highway and 5221 Penrith Drive. This site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from commercial center and residential multifamily to commercial general with a development plan and residential suburban eight with a development plan. The property is designated commercial, recreation and open space and low medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. The proposal consists of a maximum of 10,000 square feet of commercial and a maximum of 190 multi multifamily units. Please note that the applicant has reduced the number of units from 210 to 190 units. The development plan has been updated to reflect this revision, though it is not in your packet. The site is shown in red, located off of NC55 Highway in the suburban development here. The site is vacant and primarily vegetated with hardwood and pines. An existing access easement and driveway is located off in the northern portion of the site and the north prong of Northeast Creek runs along the western side of the site. The site is adjacent to a mix of existing residential, vacant commercial land and existing industrial uses. The site is presently zoned commercial center, CC, and residential multifamily, RSM, there is no existing development plan associated with this site. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation to commercial general with a development plan, CGD, and residential suburban eight with a development plan, RS8D. The property is designated commercial, recreation, open space, and low medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request. Um, you will note that the portion of RS8 is um, aligning with the very small portion of low medium density residential on that future land use map, which is a little difficult to see. It's in the, um, the southwest corner. Uh, proposed conditions, the development plan provides site access points, building and parking envelopes, tree preservation and project boundary buffers. A summary of key commitments includes uh, the proposed development will have a maximum of 10,000 square feet of commercial and a maximum of 190 multifamily units. No units are proposed within the RS8 zoned area. Transportation improvements to be provided include bus pullout and shelter, 
right turn lane, and a traffic signal. A 100-foot greenway easement shall be dedicated, and design commitments specify sloped roofs, building materials, and the use of front-facing gables as distinctive architectural features. The proposed CGD and RS8D zoning designation com complies with the current commercial recreation open space and low medium density residential designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. It is consistent with policy 222E, 231A, 232A, 814B, 1111A. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. We will open the public hearing, and as with our previous cases, we have one individual signed up to speak for. Enjoy this while this lasts. That's Mr. Jared Edens. Good evening. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. Um, I appreciate the summary by staff. I'm just gonna to touch on a few high points. Uh, I think this project is really a good opportunity for Durham, honestly. If you looked at the location, you're 10 minutes to downtown, you're 10 minutes to 40 in RTP. It's along a corridor that happens to have great infrastructure capacity. We've got water and sewer here. We've got plenty of roadway capacity here so it can handle the density, the density that we need. It also adds to a, a mixture of housing uses, uses. If you look up and down 55, predominantly they were single family up until recently, but we're starting to see townhomes. We've got some apartment projects coming on 55, so it just adds to the overall mix of housing that we need. Um, staff mentioned we're also uh, putting a signal in. Uh, we didn't have to do a TIA for the project. It wasn't large enough, but DOT made us aware of a significant accident history at the intersection of Odyssey and 55, so my client was willing to install a signal there. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting. I don't have any opposition that I'm aware of, and uh, answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? All right, we're not seeing anyone, so we will close the public hearing. Commissioners, questions, comments? Commissioner Durkin? I have a question for the applicant. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions, but um, what do you know that these will be rental? Uh, they'll be for sale townhomes. And the price point? I'm, I'm guessing here, but I'm, I'm gonna guess 220s, 230s to start. Okay. And then up. Okay. So just townhomes, though? It's not any apartment buildings? Uh, all townhomes. Okay. With the one little commercial corner that's really being provided for flexibility, but I don't really think commercials are going to get developed in that corner, but we're so the there in the, in the northeast corner, there, you don't anticipate that that will be commercial? It'll... I, don't, I don't think that it will. It's, it's there for flexibility, but I think that most likely the site will be... Uh, and from talking to neighbors, they're really not... They don't have a need for commercial there. They let us know that it really didn't matter to them. So most likely it'll be all townhomes. Okay. But as we found with some zoning cases, things can change in the future. So we just wanted some sort of flexibility. Would, you, would any flexibility, would this allow for flexibility to do multifamily? Our only options are townhomes and um, the commercial corner. Okay. And the other question I had about the 100 foot greenway easement. It says it's to be determined, but then on the development plan, um, it has a note that of a easement in favor of the city recorded at a specific book and page. So I was wondering what the recorded document required of you or of your client. It's like a, yeah, I mean, the note was requested by Parks and Rec as far as being worded that way. Um, I could not tell you what that deed reference is for. Staff, do you trails. know what the requirement is in the book and page document? I can't speak specifically to the requirement, but in general, it is um, the reference for those uh, for the ability to uh, request that easement and what is included in that easement. I don't know the specifics. Okay. Thanks. We've allocated for it here, but typically, as plans get more detailed, we work with Parks and Rec to better locate where the easement will eventually okay. go. Thank you. Other commissioners, Commissioner Miller. I just wanted to point out that you're not actually committing to townhomes and you could switch to some other form of residential development that is allowed in the uh, CG, right? Yeah, I guess technically it does say multifamily units, but the, the intention is townhomes. I mean, right. make that clear. Thank you. So I just want to make sure that when we voted, you realized that there was it was broader than, than just the stated townhomes. You're right. 
Commissioner Kenshin. Uh, yes, a question for the applicant as well. The intersection of 55 and Odyssey, uh, that's quite, um, that's a tr accident spot. You mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do to kind of alleviate that concern? Quite a few accidents at that intersection, which I can imagine would only get worse with um, this addition. Well, we're putting the signal in, for one. So we're putting the signal at the intersection, and that signal will come with it um, markings for pedestrian crossings as part of the whole signal package. So I, I really think that intersection will improve quite a bit when this goes through. Additional questions? Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. This is a uh, question for staff. On the development plan, there's a rezone. It says there's a rezoning case to the mm -hmm. south of the parcel. Do you know what that's? Uh, yes, that uh, case is scheduled, I believe, for next month. That is um, Elevate at the Park. Um, I cannot remember the specific request off the top of my head. Um, the applicant may be able to help me with the specifics if you have questions on that. Okay. I mean, is it going? Yeah, I just. So we're, we're handling that zoning to the south as well. So oh, you are. The, the plan okay. for that parcel is apartments. Apartments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Um, the applicant has already alluded to the fact that he didn't think commercial might go on that corner there, and I tend to agree with him. Uh, if you look from Cornwallis Road all the way down to I-40, <clears throat> the Cornwallis Road and Carpenter Fletcher Road, where you have some nodes already, have a little bit of commercial there, but there's been turnover. Things have failed. There's been some redevelopment going on. Um, so I, I expect that we may see all residential units on this property. What I would really like to see, though, is that rather than using general commercial zoning to get to that point, I would prefer to see the flume amended to put a residential on the flume and then a residential zoning on the property. That's just my personal opinion on the matter. <clears throat> Thank you. Additional comments, questions from commissioners? Can I follow up on you, with this question to staff? Mayor, Commissioner Miller. With this development plan drawn as it is, reserving 10,000 square feet for commercial and, and uh, the what, 190 units, even though the property will be zoned uh, general commercial with a development plan, it, uh, if the rezoning is approved, you're pretty much going to have to build those units and you could add up to 10,000 square feet of commercial, but you wouldn't be able to go in and build a shopping center. Yeah. Correct, based off the development plan. So the, the names of the zones we're using are a little counterintuitive to the predominant use, but it's still all permitted by the code. Correct. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, I just have a question. Uh, uh, that uh, Commissioner Durkin was talking about, uh, there was a note on here about Parks and Rec, and and I guess uh, the applicant could also have input. I completely missed that. Uh, is Parks and Rec planning something here, or uh, does it have to do with is my mic? Yeah, it is on now. Anyway, uh, what is going on with Parks and Rec is in this, the context of this conversation. It's, I, I believe it was a question for you, Mr. Edens. Yeah. It's really limited to just the easement dedication. That That's it. There'll be no trail construction with the site plan. This is just the note is standard note, legal wording that, that they like to see. But as far as Parks and Rec involvement, once we get the site plan and determine the exact corridor for that 100 foot easement, once that's recorded, that's basically the extent of it. Yeah, I, I was just curious as to what they were planning to do. I know I can always call them, but while I've got the people that know about it all here, uh, anyway, that that's the extent of my inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Bryan? Uh, Commissioner Gibbs, I think part of the answer is that the Greenway easement is a requirement of the city's Greenways and Open Space Master Plan. Thank you, sir. That, that does answer my question. 
Seeing no additional questions or discussion, Commissioner Johnson, I'm going to give you the chance to make the motion. <laughs> I'll take my second best option. Uh, Chairman, I move that we send forth case number Z18000019 to the City Council with a favorable uh, recommendation. recommendation. I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> Moved by Commissioner Johnson and seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. We will have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alter? Yes. Vice Chair Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes nine to one. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move to our final zoning map change of the evening. This is 707 Moorhead Avenue. It's case Z18-0031, and I will recognize Commissioner Durkin. I live in the notice area for this matter, so I'll recuse myself. I'll be back. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take an official motion for Commissioner. I, I move we uh, recuse Commissioner Durkin from this case. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryan and seconded by Vice Chair Hyman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so we will start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z18-00031, which is 707 Moorhead Avenue. <clears throat> the applicant is Robert Schunk of Stewart. The uh, property is located, um, it's the block of Moorhead Avenue, Vickers Avenue, Proctor Street, and Shepherd Street. It is located within the city limits within the Moorhead Hills Historic District. Uh, in total, the property is 2.88 acres. Um, the site was the subject of a legacy uh, zoning case, um, P, uh, P86-35. The applicant seeks a rezoning to allow all uses within the RU5-2 zoning district. There is no change to the future land use map designation, which is currently uh, medium density residential. Um, the aerial map shows the property highlighted in red. It's located within the um, urban tier and um, within the Cape Fear River Basin. These um, pictures depict the site and some of the area, uh, area conditions. The Durham City Council approved a zoning map change and development plan for the site on July 28, 1986. That development plan limited the uses to group residences, a group um, facility, recreation facility, and administrative building. Some of the buildings are shown in the photos. Um, also shown um, are properties abutting the site, uh, which include schools, professional offices, and residential uses. The zoning map, um, context map, shows the zoning um, as you can see on the left and the right, there is no change. Um, however, the applicant, as I mentioned, is looking to expand the permitted uses above and beyond what was specified in the 86 development plan. And per um, section 3512A8 of the Unified Development Ordinance, any amendment to uses shown on an approved development plan are considered a significant deviation and require the entire plan to be resubmitted for a zoning map change. In terms of consistencies with the comprehensive plan and its policies, um, the, dex, the text commitment as shown on attachment five has been reviewed by staff and, and found to be uh, determined and found to be consistent with the unified development ordinance requirements. Um, staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted ordinances and policies, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. We will open the public hearing. We have two individuals signed up to speak in favor of the project. 
Ken Spalding and George Stanziel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Ken Spalding, and I do represent the applicant in this matter. It was pointed out by staff, it's 2.88 acres in the Durham's urban tier. Uh, as was pointed out, 1986, his property uh, was rezoned with a development plan uh, which restricted uh, its residential uses to primarily uh, a brain rehab center and its appurtenance. Uh, the center has been closed for approximately three years. Uh, it is presently vacant and uh, will need to be tended to. Uh, our proposal today is only to remove the tax restrictions for the vacant brain center uh, and uh, to follow the existing underlying zoning classification. The property will remain residential with 17 new townhomes and the existing structures. Uh, Mr. Stanziel of Stewart will explain in detail uh, the land planning um, aspects of it and the uses of, of some of the uh, uh, current existing structures. The developer has met with uh, various neighbors for over a year and we did not have to have a neighborhood meeting, but we also felt that we wanted to have a neighborhood meeting uh, with the, we sent out notices of uh, 600 feet radius from the property involved and had a, had a very good and, and fruitful meeting. Uh, we do feel that uh, this is a proper transition. Uh, when we look at the area, uh, some of it is OI and, and, and uh, school and, and other aspects of it, and we feel that this proposed development at this particular location will be a tremendous asset for the Durham community and for that location. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Stangiel will give us much more detail. Uh, we were approved unanimously by the Durham uh, Historic Preservation Commission and he will get into some of that to explain the detail that this particular project has before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spalding. Mr. Stanziel. Good evening, George Stanziel, uh, President and uh, Director of Design at Stewart uh, 115 <clears throat> Cofield Circle in Durham. Um, I have uh, I'll, I've sent you a great deal of uh, specific information uh, on the project in the past several days, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, as Mr. Spaulding alluded to, the zoning is quite simple. Uh, we're not changing the zoning district. We're not adding traffic. We're not adding students. We're not changing the tier. We're making any uh, flume changes. We're merely adding by text all residential uses allowed in the RU-52 district, similar to the Moorhead Hill uh, neighborhood just adjacent across the street, uh, our neighboring community to the west, <clears throat> uh, beyond the addition, the, the institutional use that has been in place for quite some time. Um, as I pointed out to you in some of my emails, we're bringing forward a, to the city and another uniquely designed infill project in the urban tier that is walkable to downtown will create wonderful streetscapes with sidewalks, on-street parking, street trees, landscape and lighting, uh, and most importantly, will preserve and enhance the two historically significant homes. Um, I believe Commissioner Miller is pretty familiar with those homes that are there, has a wealth of knowledge. Um, that said, <clears throat> we have been approved unanimously uh, by uh, and received by the Historic Commission and, and a uh, received our certificate of appropriateness. This approval uh, involved an, ex an exhaustive application and review process that uh, included very specific uh, illustrative site plans, access points, building elevations, landscaping, lighting, paving materials, open spaces, and private courtyards. In addition, uh, the approval includes existing and proposed building elevations, which, uh, we, con which we considered, uh, where we considered architectural features from the homes that exist uh, in the Moorhead Hill neighborhood, uh, also materials and lighting. Uh, this also includes the renovation uh, and restoration of the two uh, existing historic homes. And 
as, well, as I explained to you, um, the main house will remain in place but will become two units um, and, and restored back to its original elevations and so forth. There are some uh, sort of appendages that were, were added on at some point in time that will be removed, but um, it will be restored. And then there's an existing home uh, that will be relocated to the Shepherd Street side. And the reason we're doing that is we felt like the existing home, the resident single family residential home would relate better to the existing neighborhood across the street as opposed to the O and I district on the other side, on the east side. Um, the development of our project will be guided uh, by an, uh, our approved certificate of appropriateness uh, and any changes would need to be approved by the historic commission. So um, this, this rezoning, uh, while we're not making committed, we have no committed elements to those, all of those features, we're held very strictly to a significant set of uh, very specific uh, uh, plans and, and elevations uh, for the homes. Um, so that said, I'll be happy to answer any questions and um, thank you very much. Thank you. So we will close the public hearing. Commissioners? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, hopefully two, maybe three quick questions. Mm -hmm. So maybe staff or the applicant answer this question. So the, um, the applicant mentioned that the current facility, the brain um, rehab facility has been unused for three years. So in the case that uh, under the existing zoning permission, per, what's permitted under the, what happens if that facility never doesn't become active for that original use? Like, what can can the can the owner of this parcel do anything other than reactivate that facility? Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. So the current development plan that P eighty six. 35 or I might not be mentioning it correctly. That's the zoning that basically runs with the land. So any any of those uses that are shown on the development plan, those would be what would be permissible. Um, that is why the applicant is here today seeking to expand those uses um, to allow for uh, uses above and beyond that. So maybe Mr. Stanzel, uh, so I'm just trying to get a, confirm what I'm thinking. So. Um, if you don't open that facility, what else can you do with that? What, what happens? We, this we, site? We're removing that facility. This is what the uh, removal of the text will allow. That, that's the purpose of it. And as Mr. Stanziel pointed out, we will end up, uh, that will be two uh, divided into two townhomes. Right. So basically what I'm hearing is that if, uh, given that this facility is no longer in use for the brain rehab, there's nothing else you would do with that. That's right. Right. Um, and when you when you say that you're going to split the main facility into two, is that considered part of the 17, or is that a, a multifamily type use of it? No, there's 17 new townhomes, mm -hmm. and then we will take the main uh, house, and it, be, it will become two units, and then the existing or the the existing home that we're going to relocate. So it's a total of 20 units. Gotcha. Okay. And, and final, I'm sorry, one final. Do you have a sense of uh, the price range on the new <clears throat> units? I don't think they've drilled it down quite yet. I think they're still doing a little research, but um, uh, it's it's most likely going to be somewhere in the mid sevens to mid eights. Okay. Any additional questions, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, thank you. I'm good. Okay, Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this is a, a question for staff. I'm going to follow up on comment from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission in Attachment 8. Um, so the applicant is not required to, to build a sidewalk on Proctor Street. Is that correct? Can you, so can you, can you tell us what the UDO, UDO says they must do when it comes to sidewalks here? Or ballpark? <clears throat> Just one minute, please.
transportation is coming up to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Erlene Thomas, transportation. Um, so Proctor Street is currently an unimproved street, and at the site plan stage, no sidewalks would be required unless they were required to make improvements to that street. And as they're making no connections to it, they would not be required to do it, do so by the EDO. So, so they have. Oh, are they? Do they have to? Are they required to build sidewalks anywhere else if there weren't if there weren't sidewalks on the you know. Right. Everywhere else, I believe there is existing sidewalk along the site frontage. Okay. No. Okay. Well, let me see what, except for Shepherd, maybe. Yeah, Shepherd, um, we're not required to build a sidewalk on Shepherd, but we are going to um, because there is a sidewalk across the street on the, uh, you know, on the existing uh, Moorhead Hill uh, neighborhood. But we are, we are, uh, we are going to build, so there will be sidewalks on three sides, right? Um, but not on Proctor. And that sidewalk on Shepherd is included in our site plan that was approved by the Historic Commission. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, I guess to staff, it, it, is there any consideration of changing the UDO when it comes to these sidewalk requirements? Because it seems to me like bad policy to to not require them to to build a sidewalk everywhere that's you know the on their property right um, and it well I'll wait till he The, the ordinance does require the sidewalks on both sides in the urban interior. The issue is that they're not going to improve that street. That's and they're not making street improvements, and that's why that's what Ms. Ms. Thomas was trying to explain that if they're not making an improvement, they're not required to build a sidewalk in the actual street. So if they were improving that street, then yes, they would be required. That's the issue, not that we don't require the sidewalk. It's that they're not doing the work that would kick the sidewalk improvement in. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to hear from other commissioners. Okay. I'll, I'll maybe come back. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Miller? Oh, uh, before, uh, before Commissioner Miller has the, the floor, I did want to just note that Commissioner Morgan has joined us for the minutes. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Busby, um, Transportation wanted to add one more thing to what I just said to actually just clarify the whole situation. So I'm going to let them do that real quick. Please. Um, so again, since Proctor Street is currently a gravel roadway, they would, to make those improvements, they would need to pave and construct curb and gutter and sidewalk and all of that. So that's why the sidewalk is not required along gravel roadways. Okay, thank you. Commissioner it, Miller. Let me follow up on, on that, Erlene, if I may. Uh, if it, in, at some future point the city determined to pave that block of Proctor Street, uh, it would pay for that improvement, at least in part, by uh, uh, imposing an assessment on adjacent properties, would it not? Do we still do it that way? Street assessments and those things? Uh, Bill Judge, Transportation. The, uh, it depends what they would petition for. So um, if the neighbors or the property owners petitioned for sidewalk, then there would be an assessment, but they could potentially petition just for street improvements, which would just be the paving. Without the sidewalk. Without the sidewalk. But the, but the, the cost of, of those improvements would still come through, at least in part, through an assessment. Yes. Of neighboring property owners. Yes. Just like we would for sewer water extension and existing city right of way. Yes, and for sidewalks now that are non-priority sidewalks from our dorm walks plan, it's the assessments essentially full cost, so they're rather expensive. Thank you. And I have a, a question for staff. Um, customarily, townhouses are not an RU-5-2 use except for in limited circumstances, and this is one of those limited circumstances. 
And that's because uh, Vickers Avenue is a minor thoroughfare. What is it in the UDO that triggers their ability to do, build townhouses in an RU52 zone? <clears throat> Jamie Sunyak, Planning Department. I don't have this citation, um, although I, uh, although. Do what I do, just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been vetted and it was, um, uh, it was determined that townhouses would be permissible here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out too to everyone that um, although this, this is a, a very brief uh, development plan, as uh, Mr. Stanziao uh, told us, because this is in a local historic district, everything they propose to do must go through very rigid and strict design review from the Historic Preservation Commission. And they've done that. Um, and they've gone to the neighbors. That doesn't mean that they couldn't decide to change the plan, but then they have to go through that same rigorous process again. Uh, so although this is going to be a townhouse project in RU-52, at some future point they could decide to build single-family homes according to RU-52 or duplexes according to RU-52 or any other residential use or, or use that's allowed in RU-52. But whatever they decided to do, it just have to go through that same rigorous process. So when we vote on this, we should keep that in mind, that it isn't necessarily going to be these townhouses. We're dealing with the zoning. We're not the Historic Preservation Commission. But having said all of that, I like this project. Uh, I like the way these developers have gone about designing it and getting it approved, especially their engagement with the neighbors. Uh, when I saw this coming through, I spoke with the leaders of the Moorhead Hill Neighborhood Association and they uh, summarized for me the neighbor's response to it, which was uh, in the main favorable. Um, and no one was so concerned that they felt it necessary to speak against it. Um, I will note that the main house there is the Victor Bryant house. Mr. Bryant built that house. He was a prominent uh, Durham attorney. He was very active in the North Carolina Democratic Party in the early uh, decades of the century. Uh, in 1920, he announced a run for governor uh, but I believe his appendix burst and he died before his campaign began. So he's buried in Maplewood Cemetery. I do not think you propose any change to that part of the Bryant property. Uh, certainly not for double occupancy. The, um, so all of those things are going to happen here. And moving that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, George Watt's car designed house facing Vickers around to the other corner is brilliant. And I don't know very many other developers that would have undertaken to do that would have been much cheaper just to leave it where it is and design around it. Uh, but the end result, in my opinion, will be a better thing for your project and for the neighborhood as a whole. And I thank you for it. Uh, I'm gonna vote for this. Great, thank you, Commissioner Miller. I know we all came for the zoning map changes, but we stayed for the history lesson, which I always enjoy. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I will also say I feel the same way about this project. I think this is really, it's interesting, it's exciting. You combine this with the King's Daughter Inn hearing, the hearing we had last month on Lakewood Avenue, we're seeing some of the opportunities for appropriate infill development, as well as the outreach that I think is really important to the neighbors when doing these kind of projects. So I, I also appreciate the care that you've taken, the creativity, I plan to vote for it. Other questions or comments, Commissioner Gibbs? I, I just wanted to add my comments to what you and Commissioner Miller said. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, and I have told the, the developers or the representatives of the developers that how much I appreciate uh, the effort that's gone into this particular design uh, where you've got a, a nice streetscape and the, the interior provides some access between the and privately uh, amongst the, the units. Uh, it, it's a, I just like this concept and it has applications in a lot of places. Uh, but I, that, that's all. I just wanted to voice my support, total support for this. And, and oh, is that house that you were talking about uh, uh, one of George Watts' cars' houses? The one on the corner. 
The one on the corner. The one that they're going to move. The Victor Bryant house is, uh, was built in the first decade of the 20th I century. I I remember that one. Okay. That's the, that's the big one that faces north, on faces Moorhead Avenue. That always rings a bell to me when I hear George Watt's car's name mentioned. It's uh, Anyway, I'll cease with the, the history lesson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. The floor is open for a motion for approval. Vice Chair Hyman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, make a motion that we move item Z18-00031, revisions to text commitment for the 707 Moorhead Avenue forward with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Hyman, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. This is to go to the City Council. And we'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan. I need my bank mic on. <laughs> We're in a, you good? Not on. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Alturk. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Busby. Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Keacham? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And it passes 10, 10, yes, 10 0. I forgot we had one recused. I had to check that. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we are now moving to the text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. This is the landscape and tree revisions. And this is case TC18. Quadruple zero five. We'll start with the staff report. Thank you, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, text Amendment TC 18005 primarily amends provisions of Section 8.3 tree protection and tree coverage in Article 9 landscaping buffering uh, as follows. And I'm just going to quickly list in short summary fashion. Uh, for tree coverage requirements, uh, for residential development in the uh, suburban tier, tree re coverage requirements are revised to first focus on preservation and then on tree replacement. Um, it also adds additional tree per lot requirement for suburban tier residential development. Uh, in the urban tier, it increases residential tree coverage from 3% coverage to a 7% preservation up to 10% tree replacement for development not uh, qualifying as infill development and the infill development standards would apply otherwise. And then also adds a 3% tree coverage for non-residential development where there currently is none. Uh, for landscaping and project boundary buffer requirements, the, there is an increase in the project buffer requirement along right of way for residential suburban tier developments uh, by raising the exemption threshold uh, from 60 feet in width to 80 feet in width. Uh, adds a minimum project boundary buffer requirement for mass graded residential developments. Uh, lower thresholds for required and optional natural buffers, thus requiring or incentivizing the use of natural vegetation in more circumstances. Strengthens the protection of specimen trees, uh, moves street trees closer to the right of way with the maximum distance of 10 feet, where the current requirement is maximum distance of 30 feet from the right of way, and also requires more street trees when understory trees are utilized. And then there's a number of uh, other miscellaneous changes. Um, clarifying that the amount of street trees uh, must be met even if using existing trees. Uh, that's the current standard, but we're just adding text to make that more abundantly clear. Uh, clarifying that arborists, along with other similar professionals, are the professionals to certify landscape plans and surveys. Uh, clarifies the definition of mass grading uh, in regards to phase developments, and then also revises the uh, Tuscaloosa Lakewood MPO to make sure tree coverage changes are applicable and met on a lot-by-lot -lot basis. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, Text amendment has gone to uh, the JCCPC uh, numerous times, as uh, Chair Busby can probably attest to, um, more than I can count on my fingers. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will open the public hearing. We have one individual signed up to speak in favor, Katie Rose Levin. Hello, my name is Katie Rose Levin. I'm the Executive Director of Trees Durham. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna speak about the proposed changes and I first would like to state that we have a lot of supporters in the room who would like to see these changes and some that were even more rigorous. So 
you are here to support stronger um, tree protection and planting in the EDO, please stand up. So we've got two, and we appreciate you come three. We appreciate you coming out. Um, so we started working with the planning department, uh, I guess in October, to look at the tree protection in Durham and also the tree planting requirements in Durham. Currently, Durham has the weakest tree planting and sorry, tree protection and preservation requirements out of all of our cities in the triangle. So lower than Raleigh, lower than Chapel Hill, lower than Cary, lower than Morrisville in a lot of cases. So we've been working with the planning department to change that. Um, and they've made big steps forward and we're still reaching for the floor of Raleigh, which I believe where we should put our standards. Uh, the reason why these changes are so important to be made now is because the next changes won't be made until the comprehensive plan, which we understand can take another four to six years. So this is a big opportunity between now and six years, there's gonna be a lot of development. So there are five points that we would like to bring up in regards to the uh, proposed changes. The first is the requirement to have developers plant street trees in the right of way. Currently, uh, developers are prohibited from planting street trees in the city right of way. This is a major loss of infrastructure investment by developers. Other cities do require developers to do so. And in fact, Durham itself is using taxpayer money to plant street trees in the city right of way at a rate of about 1,500 a year. So by not requiring developers to do the same, we are setting ourselves up to go back and use street and taxpayer money to replant these trees. Um, if we assume only about a mile of new developments every year, that means it's gonna take the city of Durham about three years to go back and replace those assets that the developers are not installing. So we are losing ground quickly, and if we wait for another six years or so for these developers to come in, six times three, 18 years for us to replace those assets that developers are not doing on the taxpayer dime. So we would urge the, uh, the Planning Commission to actually propose that developers be required to plant trees in the city right of way, except with a written exemption from uh, general services in consultation with urban forestry. That's actually a reversal of what the current code says, which is developers are prohibited from planting street trees in the city right of way, except with written permission. Uh, we would like to commend the planning department for advocating moving the street trees closer to the streets. Um, that is good, although we would like street trees to be next to the street. Uh, the other thing is we have uh, been in contact with general services and one of the concerns that they had expressed is uh, they would like to see HOAs manage street trees which are in HOA developments and we are supportive of that and any other ways of helping uh, make sure that our city trees are well taken care of. Uh, okay. So that is the first point. The second point is requiring a minimum of 10% tree preservation on sites for all developments two acres or more. This differs from the suggested changes that you have heard in two ways. One, uh, the changes currently proposed apply to acres four and more, which really excludes a lot of some of those smaller infill developments, excludes most small shopping centers and such. So Raleigh has two acres. The nice thing about a two acre point um, cutoff is that it excludes most single family home developments, small renovations, so it doesn't put a large burden on um, you building a new garage in your backyard or things like that, but it does catch some of the more robust uh, developments, as Raleigh has noted. The second is to have a minimum of 10% preserved trees on site. Uh, right now you heard that we are as low as 3%, and in some cases there are no preserved trees on site, so it's only replanting 3%. So Raleigh requires a minimum of 10%. That's the floor. In many cases, some of their properties require much more. Uh, we think that we can do at least as good as Raleigh. Uh, and in some cases, we can do better. And in fact, part of what uh, the planning department has proposed is a little better than Raleigh insofar as if they don't have the minimum amount of preservation on site, they have to then replant it. That's better than what Raleigh does. But we would like to see at least a 10% on all sites, commercial included. We understand from the planning department that most commercial sites choose not to preserve. So we really are losing, you know, when a Walmart comes in, that nice buffer that we look forward to. Uh, the second is to require a tree survey that's verified by an arborist. We require them to preserve trees on site, but surveyors are very good at corners and not necessarily as good at identifying trees. 
So I myself uh, am an arborist and have to go out and verify tree surveys and carry because they do require arborists to verify surveys. And I often find that uh, trees that are called trees are actually dead. So uh, I think that by requiring arborists who are professionals in the field, we're going to get more accurate information and end up preserving things like living trees. So that's three. And the fourth is to provide uh, arborist review and construction oversight. This is more of supporting uh, the planning department as they expand in their role. So uh, I just threw a lot at you, but I would love to take any questions or um, go from there. And, and what we'll do is uh, we'll close the public hearing, and if commissioners have questions, they'll call you back up. Perfect. Thank you yeah. very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this particular item? I don't see anyone, so we will close the public hearing. Bring it to the commissioners. Commissioners, questions, comments? Commissioner Johnson. I guess this is a question for staff. So uh, in response to the, the public comment, uh, is there or was there any rationale for the four acre minimum versus the two acre minimum for the required planting? Four acre minimum is a standard that the UDO uses for infill development. So we would need to take a look at policies regarding infill development and the size of infill development if we wanted to move forward with a different acreage. Mm -hmm. And are, do you, at this point, just uh, off the top of your do you see any um, potential liabilities, pros, cons, or particularly cons for going to from four to two? Um, I think it would just require additional study and research uh, to verify whether two acres is appropriate over four acres. Mm -hmm. And my second question is regarding the um, tree planting in the right of way. So, um, what's staff uh, position or thoughts on that request? And it seems to make sense. So, why didn't it end up in what we're reading? Um, I'll give a crack at it, and if I misstate something. Um, my uppers will uh, correct me or step in. Um, staff is generally supportive of putting uh, street trees in the right of way, and we've mentioned that at JCCPC numerous times. However, there are other departments that are involved, and there are other circumstances that involve improvements within the right of way. Um, so uh, there is a wish to study that m much in much more detail to make sure uh, that's a viable option. Um, thus. Uh, we felt that moving it to 10 feet within the right of way versus 30 feet in the right of way was a good balance to uh, move forward with at this time. We're not taking it off the table, but we, we want to study that and get our uh, other departments, public works, general services on board and in the discussion in more detail. So a quick follow-up to that, to that comment. Uh, considering, which I tend to agree that, you know, one, how long would that, do you anticipate that study Whatever that study. No, I don't have a time frame at this time. Right, and so with so much happening in Durham right now, and the issue with the potential loss versus pres preserving, does it is it complicated or too confrontational potentially for the onus to be on the departments who need to study it to get the exemptions? So the default being that it's there. So we take away something that's there rather than have to lobby for putting something in there in regards to trees in the right of way. So whatever department, they would come to whoever they need to to get the exemption. Um, as far as I'm aware, any time that there's been a request to put street trees in the right of way, there's been allowances for that. It's not often requested, but of the times that it has been requested, it's been granted. Right, so my point is, the request is that it that becomes a default that it's it is mandated to be a part of the development process. So, why, is there any major friction that would cause that to become the default? And the departments that need to do all the studying, which can take six months, a year, two years, and development is still be happening, to come to whoever they need to to get an exemption for having from having to put the trees in the right of way versus going to request trees and to be put in the right of way. Commissioner Johnson, the concern from our sister departments is that once the trees are in the right of way, they become the city's maintenance responsibility. And so without some sort of additional funding to go with our tree maintenance, which is not particularly well funded at the moment, we could have a really large fiscal liability for the city. That's a very insightful answer, and thank you. So it seems to be that there's a fiscal 
implication to the right of way uh, issue. And so um, I won't call for a response to that from the public, but that's good to know that that's part of the consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. Um, you've made some changes to the Tuscaloosa Lakewood MPO. Uh, does the neighborhood approve? We sent that to them. We haven't heard any comments yet, or name, but they're informed. Nothing's come back. Okay. Uh, page three, the little table at the top of the page, uh, there's a 10 top of each column and it looks to me based on what you've been doing that that should be have a strike through. Um, no, the intent was to focus on residential development in this case. Uh, there's no changes to the non-residential. Oh, okay. Uh, you talk about the suburban tier and the urban tier. To me, one of the things that's really missing is compact neighborhoods. We don't seem to have any tree preservation goals or standards for compact neighborhoods, and I think that environmentally is not good. And I'm wondering if that can be addressed. Um, that is not being addressed in this time, no. Uh, I think it should be because we're going to be talking about a compact neighborhood shortly, and there's some definite areas in there that tree save, I think, is very important. I know that there are going to be increased open space requirements for the compact neighborhood that you're going to be hearing tonight. Well, I, I would prefer to see something in an ordinance for compact neighborhoods. Uh, on page four, uh, nine, three, two existing trees, you've reduced the re root protection zone slightly, uh, but I seem to remember we had a lot of discussion when it was 80%. Uh, is this reduction okay with arbors? Yeah, we talked to staff uh, involved with that, and it actually brings it into consistency with other actual uh, tree preservation uh, stand <clears throat> root protection zone requirements um, in other parts of the ordinance. Uh, mm -hmm. And the 75% does seem like a little bit of reduction or less of protection, but it actually allows for more trees to qualify as being protected. Mm -hmm. Okay. and. My final question, uh, we have trees along the street, and I believe we should. Uh, if those trees get cut down so that the street could be widened or something like that or sidewalks put in, uh, will there be any requirement that those trees be replaced? Well, my experience in the past of where the city or other government agency has gone in to uh, remove required vegetation that they've had to replace it. Well, good, because on Old Chapel Hill Road, you've got some places where you need to start putting some trees back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Miller? So I wanted to, a little help on page one of our materials here of the actual ordinance itself uh, in, I guess it's 465C1B. I don't think it reads right. For tree coverage requirements per SEC 8.3 tree protection and tree coverage shall be met on a lot by lot basis. Something is missing in that sentence. Thank you, I'll correct that. Uh, and I was also now over on page four, nine, four, two, A, one. In the suburban tier, a protect uh, project boundary buffer for a residential project is not required adjoining a street or railroad right of way that are greater than 80 feet. I believe it is greater. Okay. But I, one of my problems is, is it's not clear to me, uh, and it may be just because of the way we extract things to present them, who, what the agency is here. Who is responsible for planting these trees? That are When we require trees to be planted, who has to plant them? The applicant or developer who 
the person who is implementing the site plan or subdivision. Or somebody who's just building a house. Right. And so it's got to be done in that process. What if afterwards the tree is removed, cut down, or just dies? Is there, is the, do these impose ongoing requirements to maintain the trees? Yes, um, and enforcement's an issue. Um, and it's usually complaint driven. So I've got 110 feet of road frontage in front of my house in the urban tier. I have two trees that, that are within 30 feet of the right of way. What am I going to have to do to comply with this if it passes? Nothing at, the, at this time you're not doing, unless you're building a new house. So it's not triggered unless I build something. This doesn't impose, go back and- It's not retroactive. Make somebody do something that, if they're not gonna do anything. Correct. Um, how small does my project have to be to trigger the tree requirement? Um, the infill standards have their own landscaping section, um, so it defers to that. Otherwise, if you're beyond infill or if you're in the suburban tier, you're <coughs> triggering the tree coverage requirement. There's a couple other caveats. So if I build an accessory building or dwelling, will that trigger it? No. All right. Thank you. That helps a lot. And then finally, help me understand uh, section 944, natural buffers. Uh, it alarms me whenever I see us saying buffers can be narrower or have less opacity. This is actually triggering, this is, these are the instances that trigger the requirement for a natural buffer. So reducing the numbers is actually capturing more instances that a natural buffer or using the existing vegetation would be required. And thus the same thing for the option, we're reducing that number to encourage or incentivize more opportunities and more use of a natural buffer option. So 9.4.4a has to do with the rural and suburban tiers. Right. And then we get down to B. Explain to me how that works with an example, if you would, because I'm not sure I get it. It's not because it isn't clear. It's just because I don't get it. It's just saying that um, you can use the natural buffer as an option if those are triggered, that particular instance is triggered. You can go down to 20 feet and you would you can use natural buffer as an option. Mm -hmm instead of a constructed buffer of replacing and putting in new vegetation. And, all right. My concern is, is that in the urban tier, 20 feet of, 20 feet of trees anywhere is not an effective buffer. To me, a buffer is a device that we want to create in order to make incongruous neighbors stable neighbors. And when I go out and I look at uh, mature growths of trees that get cut up. If you leak, if you go out and find uh, half an acre of tries and you cut it up so that 20, a 20 foot strip of those trees is left, you've got trees nobody wants. You've got trees that are 75 feet tall with the lowest limb at 50 feet. It's a bunch of toothbrushes. It just doesn't seem to me that that, it may save some trees, but it no longer functions as a buffer between those incongruous uses, and the, the, is the, that a risk? The, the thing with natural buffers is still you have to meet opacity standards, and- So you would still have, this doesn't do away with the requirement of supplementing. Correct. All right, thank you, I'm satisfied. Great, thank you. Vice Chair Hyman. I'd like to ask this question of staff, please, and it's, it's a, a situation that I'm familiar with since we were uh, discussing planting trees in the city in the right of way. Are there any circumstances, and I'm looking at um, general standards where in this particular section it shall apply to construction of any primary structure and shall apply to individual lots. So I'm talking about an individual lot. Are there any circumstances that would allow planting of trees in the easement or right of way? Well, you can request that of of uh, if the requirement for street, if you're trying to meet street tree requirements and you request it, you can. Uh, okay. the, down the design districts 
uh, do allow for street plantings in the right of way. Um, in easements, I wouldn't be able to tell you for certain for easements. Usually, there's pretty much there's usually uh, depending upon the easement, there's usually pretty strict restrictions on the types of plantings you can do in easements, um, especially for like stormwater and such. Right, and then the second part of that, then who would be responsible? I know enforcement is always an issue, and who would be responsible then for those trees once they're in the right of way? Oh, if you put trees in the right of way, as, as, as Scott had alluded to earlier, they're the responsibility of the city. Commissioner mm. Miller. So, her question raises a question to me. These requirements are minimum requirements of somebody who is engaged in a triggering activity, development activity. Mm -hmm. It ain't got anything good to go back to my 110 feet on Virginia Avenue in the urban tier. If I wanted to add a tree to the two trees I've already got, I could go to, and I wanted to plant it in the right of way mm -hmm. so that it would become a city owned street tree. I can still apply to the city for that permission and work with the city arborist, and they may or may not allow me. That This isn't touching that. No. Commissioner okay. Atterk. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm clear on tree coverage in so 8.31C. So the, in the suburban tier, we did we, in the past, we had a zero, you know, zero percent was the Right, we didn't have. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, could repeat. Sorry, that. so so in the suburban tier now there's a minimum of 20 percent preserved tree coverage that's required. Is that correct? Right. Correct. And then in the urban tier, that has gone from three percent was the previous um, requirement, and now it's seven percent. Correct. Right. Okay. So can I? I guess I'm asking you this question in light of attachment E, the recommendations from Trees Durham, which is. In other cities, it seems like they just have one number, and it. So in Chapel Hill, it's everywhere within Chapel Hill, twenty percent. Uh, in Cary or in Winston Salem, ten percent everywhere. So is there a reason why in the suburban tier there's, you know, you're recommending twenty percent, and then the urban tier you're recommending seven? It's just a uh, a recognition of a different urban form. There's usually more room in the suburban tier to accommodate that set aside of land, uh, which is usually a. 20% is a substantial set aside, um, where in the urban tier you're dealing with much more, uh, much smaller lots, usually in fill development, and or either older or already built upon lots, uh, much older development. So there's different urban and built characteristics in the urban tier generally than in the suburban tier. Mm. But the other cities do not make that distinction, is that correct? Some cities do not, that's correct. Okay. Mm. Um, if I may, Chair, I'd like to ask Ms. Levin, is that right? To comment on this issue, and I, just because it seems like you know this issue very well, um, is there a reason for this distinction that makes sense to you, um, and just based on the other cities as well? Right, they've done. so um, my, Michael point, Michael's point is well taken that there are different uh, opportunities in, typically in an urban versus a suburban tier. One of the reasons why, for example, Raleigh has a 10% minimum across that is when there are those opportunities, they want to make sure they capture them. So the rezoning project you just did now was 2.8 acres, and there would be opportunity there to at least seek, uh, in Raleigh's case, they would say 10%, in our case, it'd be 20%, and if you couldn't find them, then you would be required under the current, uh, if it was a minimum of 10%, you would seek to find that 10%, preserve those, and then go back and replant up to the max. Right. And so I think that that's a good strategy. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit different with our way of which uh, with Durham's proposal versus what Raleigh does is Durham is then saying you have to at least meet a minimum coverage, which is a combination of planting and preservation. Mm -hmm. Where Raleigh says it's just if you don't, you have to just meet preservation and that's it. And if you don't get it, you don't get it. So that's a little bit of a differentiation there. Um, you know, most other cities don't differentiate because they see the value in trying to seek at least a minimum. Uh, in Durham, sustainability and resiliency plans, they are looking for 55% uh, tree canopy coverage across Durham City County. And if we're only requiring 3% uh, preservation in some areas, that's just mathematically not very possible, which is something that Charlotte actually discovered. They had a canopy coverage goal, and they realized without increasing the amount of trees they preserved all across the city, they weren't going to be able to do that. 
Durham you know, has a similar goal and similarly we're asking them to increase to at least a floor in all areas of 10% uh, and in some cases 20% where it's applicable like suburban areas where you're developing vast tracts of land. Thank you. If, if I may, and since you're, mm -hmm. you have you, um, you know, so you, you heard some of the discussion about the logistical challenges with putting trees right on the mm -hmm. right of way. Uh, I think it seems like SAF is trying to come up with a compromise, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, it originally was 30 feet, now it's 10 feet. And w can you say how you feel, or, you know, what, what's your take on that? Is that a good compromise uh, right. position for now? And then we can study it later. One of the, so there are three, maybe three points to bring up. First is that um, one of the reasons they don't want to put the trees in the city right of way is they're worried about the maintenance costs. Right. Uh, well, the city is a growing city, and so we're increasing the maintenance needs of everything, not just trees, but sidewalks, fire hydrants, street lights, and things like that. And so um, we're, we're not stopping people from installing street lights because we're gonna have to buy more trucks as the city expands. So I would say that saying, yes, we have to maintain city utilities means we need more people is uh, the natural consequence of a growing city. Uh, so that's one. The second is there's a little bit of an environmental justice aspect of it. In some uh, mm. under-resourced neighborhoods, they can't afford to take care of trees. And so by putting them in the city right of way, we're giving people the opportunity to have access to tree canopy coverage. Uh, putting trees between the street and the sidewalk uh, from a transportation standpoint gives you more direct protection for pedestrians walking along the roads, both physical protection from cars hitting you, uh, as well as other types of benefits like cooler air, uh, cars naturally slowing down up to 10 miles an hour, some research is showing. So you're really getting significant benefits by putting the trees physically between the sidewalk and the road as opposed to in the, in the yard. Because uh, frankly, if once you plant, if a city right of way is 35 feet off the edge of curb and then you're allowed to go 10 feet back from there, you're looking at trees that are called street trees that are in essence up to 45 feet off the street. Uh, which is one of the reasons why in a lot of developments you will drive around and see street trees that are right in front of the house. So uh, I would say, uh, are you, when you ask me is it a good compromise, I think it's a good step. Uh, one of the things I'm worried about is how long it'll take us to get to actually putting them in the right of way. And I think uh, Commissioner uh, Johnson brought up this idea of like why wouldn't you require it unless there's a reason not to, especially because the city is currently planting trees in the right of way, so they're saying they can take on not only that liability, but also that it should be done as a policy. Thank you, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I, I had a, a couple questions as well. I also did wanna just, first of all, start by thanking the staff for their work on this, as Mr. Stock mentioned. This has come before multiple bodies. I know the Joint City County Planning Committee, which, I, which I've served on as the Planning Commission Chair just in the last 18 months. We've seen this at least three times, and it has continued to improve, mostly based on the, the really great comments from Trees Durham and other community input. Uh, the questions that I had, which I clearly didn't get a chance to ask at the other three previous meetings, but <laughs> This is my last chance. So, so how how do they how do you calculate the tree coverage and and is that in here somewhere? The, how yes, do you, how it's, do you do it's that? within tree coverage um, calculation, root protection zone calculation, coverage requirements are within section eight point three. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but not in the handout. Not in the handout. No, All right. Thanks. but that we yeah. weren't we weren't touching that section. So great, that's great. Thank you. And then, uh, do you know how how does the city? So the city of Raleigh plants trees in the right of way, but you raised the issue then of the cost, the maintenance cost for the city. Do you know how much that costs the city of Raleigh? Do we have any idea what that means to go that route? They, when I spoke to them, they don't know the actual future impacts of when I spoke to their arborist or the, that department head. Um, so I wasn't able to get that kind of information. I appreciate that you, you were looking for it. Uh, I, mean, I will say Commissioner Johnson's questions really struck me as the issues that I've been grappling with. I, I'm planning to vote for this. I appreciate that Trees Durham is indicating we should, they're recommending we should vote for it. Our decision tonight is to either vote no and to stay exactly where we are 
board to vote yes to begin to move forward. So I am going to vote yes to begin to move forward. But I, I do regret that we are not taking the additional steps of saying you should proactively plant in the right of way and be able to then move forward to ask for an exemption to not do it. Uh, it's the, the opt out requirement, I think, is the better way to go, even though we don't necessarily know the cost for maintenance. We're just going to miss uh, huge opportunities. And I also believe going with two acres or more compared to four acres or more are, is a better way to move forward. So I, I hope we will be back here soon to continue to increase these ordinances to meet what our neighbors require. We're not asking to do anything outlandish. This is, we're still in many ways falling short of our neighbors and we're missing opportunities every day. But I do appreciate that we're beginning to move forward. So I, I do plan to vote for it. Commissioner Johnson. I just have one, and this is for, um, I guess the, the chair. So I don't, I think that this is a actual path forward versus, you know, two steps back. So is our option basically if we don't want to kill it, like to just provide comments to the, okay. Other commissioners may weigh in, but, but that's how I see it is that if, if we, you can vote it down and put in comments for why it's still a step forward and why you voted against it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm planning to go the opposite route. I would like to signal that we should approve it, but I am going to put in my comments the places where I believe we're falling short and, con and should gotcha. continue to improve. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, but, but I think your remarks probably has answered uh, one of them, and that is uh, what flexibility is there in uh, not adhering to the so-called required uh, minimums of tree plantings, uh, uh, locations, uh, But I, it, it, there is, well, I'll just ask the question, uh, staff. Uh, there is some flexibility in uh, these, these guidelines uh, for uh, seeking relief or whatever. For? For private, uh, for private citizens. Relief and for which aspect are you <clears throat> talking about? Uh, the required tree, uh, is it the, the buffers uh, along streets? Oh, uh, the street trees? Street trees. Oh, uh, for street trees, yes. The current, the current provision, there is an allowance to request to put them in the right of way where they would otherwise be required to be placed on private property. And, and now that you've mentioned <coughs> private property, uh, they, so this is, and I haven't gone into this in, <clears throat> in depth, uh, there is a requirement for private property owners to plant or leave certain uh, percentages of canopy uh, trees. Usually the uh, tree protection is in more common open space for the subdivisions. So it, it wouldn't, unless it's a very small subdivision, usually tree coverage or preservation requirements are not on, a, on the lot by lot, if we're talking about the suburban tier. Okay. Uh, and one last question, and I ask this uh, because of past experience. When there is a requirement uh, on the edge of a property at the street, uh, for certain plantings, and I'm sure you, there will be uh, uh, some selections, uh, species or whatever for plantings and trees. Is there, is there an allowance for waiting until the better time to plant them, say, in the spring, the fall, or the whatever, I was involved in one project uh, in downtown, and this was years ago, uh, and we had uh, a certain number of days to get these plantings in the ground, and it was 
summertime, hot as you know what, and dry. And we didn't have any rain for <laughs> weeks and weeks. They all died. So you had so that I, I'm hoping there will be some. There are currently provisions to allow for delayed planting or bonding of landscaping until an appropriate time for that planting. Yeah, I, and I hate to be picky, but it it just uh, it's something to to think about. Uh, I have a lot of issues with some of these things, but I'm not going to bring them up now uh, because I need to read it uh, a little closer. But I, I'm going to support this too because I, I like tree canopies and, um, and we do not need to follow what Raleigh or Kerry or whatever does. Durham has its own situations. It's nice to get some ideas from other places, but uh, we, we need to tend to our own designs uh, relative to what we have going on here. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion at this time. Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to mo make a motion that we send item TC one eight zero 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 five ordinance text amendment uh, tree coverage and landscape revisions forward uh, with a favorable recommendation. Properly motioned a second. Second, second, second. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. First, <laughs> we'll have a roll call vote, please. Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes 10 to 1. Thank you. We are on to our final item this evening. This is a text amendment with rezoning. So this is the Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District. So this is case T1, I'm sorry, TC1800009 and zoning case Z1800030. Uh, I will remind you, if you have not signed up for public comment period, uh, you may do so, or just let me know. We'll start with the staff report. Um, Chair, Bus Chair Busby, uh, real quick yes. before we get started, I wanted to just um, make sure that the commissioner commissioners are aware of how the voting should go on this particular case, the order of cases. So the, the TC case should be voted on first, then the zoning case, and then the the third um, item you have to vote on is the street network plan. So there's there's three items to vote on. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Good Thank evening, you. folks. I'm Lisa Miller with the Planning Department. Uh, I'm here this evening uh, to ask you to I consider uh, case TC18. 30, a text amendment establishing regulations for a new type of design district, the Compact Suburban Design District. Uh, case Z1830, a zoning map change request to apply those new regulations um, uh, and the, the Compact Suburban Design District to the Patterson Place Compact Neighborhood Tier. And finally, the future street network plan for this compact neighborhood tier. Uh, if you recall my presentation at the January 3rd Planning Commission as an informational item focused on the background of the project from both a planning and policy perspective, as well as the public input process for the project um, that's been going on for about two and a half years, um, as well as the existing design district, district framework um, that is in place for the compact design district in the Knight Street area um, and for the d downtown design district. Uh, today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on um, just briefly kind of back up a second and talk big picture about the policy framework um, for why this project in this location at this time. 
Um, and I'm then going to talk about focus on the differences in the text amendment uh, between the compact suburban design district with the existing design districts, uh, knowing that there's commonalities in the framework with all three of them. Um, I'll talk about some of the particulars with the zoning map change, uh, the details of future street network, and then upcoming steps in the project timeline. Uh, so just to take a step back for a moment, what are design districts? Um, some of you have heard this before, but design districts are our form-based zoning districts that are intended um, and by policy uh, we're directed to be placing within our compact neighborhood tiers uh, in order to create over time as redevelopment occurs, high density, mixed use, and multimodal friendly developments. Um, there's obviously a variety of characteristics that come along with this, uh, greater heights and intensities, um, a mixture of land uses and kind of unifying the uses that are allowed within the district as a whole, um, really focusing on how the buildings interact with public space along the street uh, and creating greater connectivity of a street network in order to promote greater transportation choices um, and street designs that also do that. So just a few, uh, a few additional policy uh, items related to the particular design district being put in place for Patterson Place. Um, this area was established as a suburban transit area uh, at the time that the 2005 comprehensive plan was put in place. Those were kind of seen as a compact neighborhood light or to become future compact neighborhoods. So the idea of creating uh, an area with mixed use greater intensity development for this area has been in place for 13 years. Um, we also, uh, in the summer of 2016, both our city and county elected officials approved uh, the existing compact neighborhood boundary and changed to that designation from the previous suburban transit area designation. At that time, they also changed, uh, approved the change of the future land use within the compact neighborhood to design, indicating that the future zoning within that boundary was to be design district. Um, as well, uh, I just wanted to mention that the Joint City County Planning Commission or Committee uh, has directed planning staff to work towards city-initiated implementation of design district zoning for our compact neighborhood tiers. The proximity of this area to two high-volume transportation corridors in US 15501 and Interstate 40 and the proposed light rail alignment set this compact neighborhood up for success as a high-intensity area both now and in the future regardless of the transportation form that is utilized. In addition, as mentioned in the staff report, there's an ongoing effort to reimagine the 15501 corridor. Um, the study has emphasized the need for multimodal connectivity both across 15501 and through 15501 as regional move movement. The alternative, uh, alternatives for this segment of the study uh, that has come out of public input on that project include significant improvements for bicycle and pedestrian connectivity. While the corridor may never be the ideal companion to the compact neighborhood, staff from the MPO, Durham and Chapel Hill are working together to reduce the negative impact of this major transportation corridor on the vision for future focused development of all four quadrants of where 15501 and I-40 meet. Um, there has been significant cross-jurisdictional cross interest and coordination in comprehensive planning of those four quadrants. Uh, the southwest quadrant is the gateway station location for the proposed light rail. Uh, the northwest quadrant is the east town area where UNCU is, is planning and doing a lot of development. And the other two quadrants are incorporated by the Patterson Place compact neighborhood. Uh, and finally, our community is seeing considerable growth. The number 20 people a day comes up a lot. Um, so we as a community are looking for ways to uh, accommodate that growth. Um, the compact neighborhood tier framework allows us to accommodate that within our city limits, um, where that growth can occur without destroying the existing character of the community and where transportation and utility infrastructure already exist, with easier access to existing services um, and in an overall more sustainable fashion than sprawling development. 
So with that policy framework in mind, I will uh, go through quickly the details of the proposed uh, three items that we're asking for your consideration on. So the first case is the text amendment, again, to create a new compact suburban design district. Uh, the intention is for it to be applied in um, compact neighborhood tiers where the existing character is more suburban in nature, um, where the, it's less space constrained than the areas where our downtown and compact uh, design districts are applied. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility of what we can do with the requirements. Um, this new district will utilize the established frameworks for design districts, um, but, and, and that includes um, the establishment of sub-districts, uh, as you can kind of see in the graphic here, showing the tapering of intensity from the core out to uh, the support to sub-district and the surrounding uh, usually residential development. So that framework includes uh, parameters for building placement, uh, minimum and maximum height and density regulations, uh, the utilization of building and frontage types that prescribe how street-facing parts of buildings are designed and shape public space. It includes the uh, design standards that ensure kind of a basic level of good design um, and establishes requirements for new streets, maximum block sizes, um, and provisions for public space along the street that we refer to as streetscape. So while the framework for that district is already in place, there's modifications that we're proposing in the details of some of those uh, elements. Uh, pages three through six of your staff report lists extensively the changes that are proposed. I'm going to go through them briefly here, starting with article 16, which is the design district article, um, and then going through the changes to other articles. Uh, so the first section of Article 16 establishes minimum and maximum densities by sub-district that are allowed by right. Um, the, it, it also then removes the density maximum for developments that utilize the affordable housing bonus, which I'll talk about uh, again a little bit later. Uh, this section also prov uh, includes provisions for dense single and two-family residential in only the support to sub-district. Um, as long as it falls within the allowable density range of nine to 15 units per acre. This section also includes establishment of what we're calling a transitional use area that is a 200 foot area measured from the, two, uh, the tier boundary where the support one subdistrict is adjacent to that boundary. It would require that any development encroaching into that area would require a major special use permit approval. It establishes exemptions for existing development and public right of way, um, and has specific review factors that include environmental protections, lighting, effects on nearby properties, conformance to adopted plans, and other factors. The next section deals with site design. Um, as I mentioned, we have a little bit more room uh, as we're dealing with sub existing suburban character. So we propose a build to zone in this area, the place where the build, building has to be located with respect to the back of curb of 15 to 25 feet, as opposed to the 12 to 18 that's in place for our other design districts. Uh, we're also proposing to rename open space to public space, just to kind of indicate a different character from the open space requirements that are in place for our more residential sub, uh, subdivision projects, um, which would apply in all design districts. We've lowered the thresholds in the compact suburban design district for when public space is required on the site um, and increased the percentage required from 2% in the other districts to 5% here. The next section deals with building design. Um, in the compact suburban design district, there were no building or frontage types that uh, the community wanted to not see in any particular subdistrict, so all of them are allowed in all subdistricts. Um, we have included some modifications to the frontage type requirements where the street frontage is along a freeway, um, and that applies to all design districts, not just to this one. This section establishes uh, minimum and maximum heights, both podium heights, which is the initial height that the building can go up before it has to step back, and then a maximum overall height, um, and again establishes uh, an increase in height that's allowed using the affordable housing bonus. 
So for this project, uh, what we have been encouraged to do is to modestly raise the buy rate densities uh, from what's existing. Um, in or, and uh, basically what we're doing is trying to ensure that the buy right density is the minimum necessary to be considered transit supportive. Um, we then only allow higher heights and re remove the density restriction uh, only through use of the affordable housing bonus, which is adopting the interim strategy that, that has been used, um, put in place with a previous project. Um, there are some potential implications of this um, that we need to be aware of. So monitoring um, the results of this approach is something that we will definitely be doing in order to figure out um, its effectiveness and whether we need to make changes to this proposal. Um, and we also know that zoning can't solve affordable housing. Uh, I think there is no one silver bullet. Um, and so we all know that we need to be layering approaches to how we provide for affordable housing. Um, uh, I, I went through this some at the last meeting, but the Triangle J Council of Governments report that was included in your packet last time and this time um, notes that in this area, there's a, a pretty significant number of existing naturally occurring affordable housing units um, of a total of just under 1,200 multifamily and single family units inside the tier. 844 of those are affordable to those who make 60 to 80% of area median income, and 88 of them are affordable to those earning 60% of area median income or below. Um, so one of the strategies that we are talking with and working with community development on is looking at the uh, preservation of those existing affordable uh, naturally occurring affordable units. Um, other strategies called out in that report that are appropriate for the Patterson Place area include tax increment finan financing or special assessment districts. Um, as development occurs, to be able to use that those funds in order to either create or preserve affordable units, um, as well as looking at trying to uh, make available grant funds for folks who are interested in utilizing the bonus, but recognizing that there's an offset of cost needed. So the last section of the design district article of the UDO deals with our rights of way, um, block and lot sizes, and the streetscape amenities or the area within that um, public realm along the street. So again, we're uh, proposing to establish an eight foot clear zone in this district as opposed to the five foot clear zone that is required in our other design districts. We've also included a sidewalk option that has um, provision for stormwater control measures. So actually dealing with some of the stormwater mitigation within the right of way in the sidewalk area. Um, we've also included some minor modifications to the street requirements um, that apply to all design districts. Um, and while the general maximum block length and uh, size requirements apply to this district as well. We did include an exemption from uh, block standards for situations where you have an existing transporta major transportation corridor or environmental feature that may not allow full conformance uh, as long as greater conformity with those standards is achieved. So there's a handful of changes proposed in other articles to the UDO, um, creating a new intent statement for this new district. We're proposing to remove the major transportation uh, corridor overlay from applicability in any of the design districts. There's a new table, a uh, new column added in the use table for this new district uh, and a number of modifications to limited use standards for this district, most of which are in line with those that are in place for the compact design district. Um, we've created new steep slope standards, which I'll go into on the next slide. Uh, proposed a modification to screening requirements just for very tall buildings where mechanical equipment can be seen from much further away than just the adjacent rights of way. Um, some modifications to the minimum and maximum parking requirements and the allowances when you can exceed the maximum parking requirements, um, and some modification to the non-conforming use provisions in order to assist with the transition of an existing suburban uh, context towards this more urban context that we're working towards. 
So the steep slope requirements that we're proposing uh, define steep slopes as 15% greater, greater, as opposed to 25%. Uh, it reduces the area by half to 2,500 square feet instead of 5,000. It does not allow disturbance within the defined steep slopes except for, for public rights of way um, and allows 100% of the steep slope area to count towards residential density calculations as opposed to the 15% that's allowed elsewhere. And these are proposed to apply just in the, comp uh, the Patterson Place compact neighborhood for now. Um, so that is the extent of the text amendment uh, changes proposed. So the zoning map change um, is the application of that new compact suburban design district to the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier, uh, including the drawing of the sub-districts for core support one and support two. Um, there were some questions at the last meeting about the size of those districts. So the districts were established with public input um, and I just wanted to show this map here, which hopefully you can see. The purple and the green lines are the areas that were proposed for inclusion in the core by the public, um, where they wanted to see the most intense development. I think a lot of that came from, uh, based on the discussions had, that along 15501 and 40, we're not having to taper intensity because of the adjacent character of uh, development. So having the opportunity to create more intensity there. The reason that we have retracted the boundaries from that has to do with the affordable housing bonus. We wanted to make sure that the core area, there's sort of our TOD planning consultants um, that worked with us on the grant that's mentioned in the staff report, said that the 600 foot area around a proposed station is the area where office is most desirable because people are much less likely to walk longer distances to their job than they are to their home. So we wanted to make sure that within that uh, core area that we were making sure that we allow and encourage non-residential use. We wanted to then significantly incentivize outside of that core use of the affordable housing bonus to get a big bump in height if you're using the bonus, but otherwise to not, uh, the height limitation is 45 feet in that area. And then because the support one affordable housing bonus strategy gets you 90 feet in height, we wanted to do a larger um, support two district to create greater area of transition down to the old Chapel Hill Road area where people had the most concern about that transition. So again, this is the proposed sub-districts. Um, that we have at this time based on that public input and then modifications based on the affordable housing um, strategy. So in addition to the overall map change, there are two properties, uh, again mentioned in the staff report, but they are parcels where there's existing development plan zoning in place um, that crosses the tier boundary. So in order to not create a messy zoning situation with the leftover areas outside of the tier, um, and also because both of those cases, the development plans include commitments for preservation of significant acreage, uh, on one about 25 acres and on the other about 52, um, pri uh, again, primarily outside of the compact neighborhood tier. Um, so we are working with the property owners to translate those protections um, and to protect that acreage with the rezoning. Those proffers will utilize the text-only development plan mechanism that was recently adopted. Um, we're finalizing the exact ordinance language right now, but the draft language related to restricting the use on the property is uses within the property designated as the zoning district um, shall be limited to parks and open space use category of section 5.1 the use table and further limited to recreational trails. And these are close-ups of the two sites. The, the dotted line is the tier boundary. The hatched area is the parcels. You can see the amount of area um, outside of the tier that's, that is uh, left of the parcel. 
So the final piece of the project that we're asking for your recommendation and action on, um, this is the future street network for the compact neighborhood tier. Um, we have worked with transportation and public work staff to draft this and vetted it through the public. Um, the intention is for it to tie into the future trail network that um, the, the trails shown on this map here are shown in green dotted lines are from the Comprehensive Transportation Plan multi-use path layer, and those are conceptual. Will require, um, as noted previously, additional work with Parks and Rec to identify exact locations and feasibility and whatnot. Um, but the two are intended to, to work together. One of the things that we have noted in the work that we've done with the Compact Design District and the Downtown Design District is that getting that base level of connectivity in order to create the walkable urban form is absolutely essential to everything else. Um, and in going into an area with much more suburban context, this was an important piece of that for this work. So finally, I know that was a lot, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me. Um, so we are scheduled for uh, city council informational item and presentation in March, as well as to the county commissioners. Both of those are at work sessions. Um, and the next steps will include public hearing at the city council um, for the text amendment, zoning, map change, and street network, the county commissioners for the text amendment and the future street network because the entire area to be rezoned is within city jurisdiction. So with that, I would be happy to answer questions. Great, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. It, it was worth the time. <laughs> so we will, I'm sure we'll have questions for you. I think we will open the public hearing. Uh, I knew, I know there was one other individual who was here at the beginning of the meeting who said they were planning to speak, so we left the sheet out mm -hmm. just in case they showed up. But if, if someone doesn't mind bringing the sheet over, thank you. I know, I know it was brought over earlier. Thank you. And we have a number of individuals who are signed up to speak and on an issue that's this complicated, it's probably not surprising that it's not as clear cut with there's just a certain number who are for it, a certain number who are against it. There are a few folks that are saying that they are partially for or partially against with caveats. And so what we normally do is we usually have 10 minutes for each side, 10 minutes for those who are speaking for and 10 minutes who are speaking against. Uh, I think just to allow us, and knowing there may be one additional speaker who may be coming back to this meeting, I would recommend that we consider allowing 15 minutes per each side just to give us a little extra time. If, if, if folks are open to that, I would welcome a motion to that. So effect. moved. Second. Seconded. Great. Uh, how, moved. Many, how, uh, can, how many uh, individuals have, have um, requested to speak? We have eight individuals, I'm sorry, seven. Seven individuals who have signed up to speak, and I believe there's an eighth who may be returning to this meeting. Uh, I was just, I, I would suggest that we give each three minutes since they may not want to fall on the floor again. So rather than get stuck within a 15 minute cushion, just give three minutes each to them. I, I believe a few speakers were hoping for a little more time, and I think a few speakers may just have a minute or two. Okay. Mr. Chairman. I like your idea, if I consider it as a possible alternative, I'd like to, to give everybody either four minutes or 15 minutes aside and nobody gets less than four minutes. No individual gets less than four minutes. I see people running the numbers in their head. I don't, I don't even want to go through is that there, exercise. Is there, that, that is a, a motion, is there a second? This is a, this is a big thing, this is a lot of paper. Yeah, it is. And I don't want to have people come up and say, only have time to say I like it, I don't like it, I want to hear it. And that, that's my concern, so. Great, Fine. if there's a second, this will become the, the motion that we will consider. Second. Second, all right, properly moved and seconded. And the motion, if you may restate it so we know. Essentially 15 minutes aside, but that no speaker be cut off before they've had four minutes. Great. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So you can see the clock has four minutes per speaker. If you don't need four minutes, I encourage you to not use the four minutes. You can, but if you need it to say what you believe is important, this is a big issue and we want to allow appropriate time. 
So we always start with those who have signed up to speak for the proposal. And so we have three individuals who have signed up to say I am speaking in favor without caveats. So we will start with those three individuals. Um, let me find them. Patrick Biker, Jay Hikes, and Jim Savara. Good afternoon. I guess I have to say good evening now. Uh, good evening, Chairman Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. Uh, that's in the Rockwood neighborhood, but uh, obviously uh, for shopping needs, my family has spends a lot of time in the Patterson Place area. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the staff recommendation reflected in the staff report that's before you tonight. And uh, over the years, Morningstar Law Group has represented many property owners uh, within this um, proposed design district. But tonight, I'm here on behalf of the um, ownership group that uh, owns approximately 100 acres. It's affectionately refer referred to as the Oak Ridge 58 assemblage. Um, what we'd like to say for the record is, is this, if this rezoning, Z180030, is approved by the City Council no later than uh, in April, and in this form reflected in the staff report, we will offer a text-only development plan. Uh, we are fine-tuning the language with the staff, and I do want to say how much we appreciate their hard work on the initiative that's before you this evening. Uh, this initiative goes back many years. I believe I attended all the public outreach meetings, uh, and I was there uh, simply as a citizen of Southwest Durham and a former member of the Durham Area Transit Authority uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we had a plan that would work. <coughs> Regarding the specifics of the property ownership group that I'm here tonight, uh, our text-only commitment would first remove the area within the 200-foot uh, transitional use area from a grading-only site plan that's currently pending in the planning department. That's case D18-00258. Then also implement environmental protections for approximately 52 acres out of the 68.3 acres uh, in parcel ID 206066. And that's associated with the existing development rights for that parcel. Uh, specifically to build uh, 346 residential units that were approved back in 1988 in case P88-6. We look forward to drafting this specific text amendment with the staff in the near future. And again, we specifically encourage you to support the staff recommendation that's before you this evening. It reflects many years of hard work. It is, a, uh, I think, a well-done compromise. It reflects voluminous com community input and we hope you'll support it. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Mr. Hikes. Good evening, Chair and members of Planning Commission. My name is Jay Hikes. I'm a transit-oriented development planner with Go Triangle, the agency designing the Durham and Orange County's light rail line, which will have a station at Patterson Place, as Lisa alluded to. You may ask yourself, why does a transit agency care about a rezoning? To quote Brent Tadarian, the former chief planner of Vancouver, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. As a transit agency, our mission is to connect people and places, and we believe this rezoning will help us do that in three ways. First, the rezoning will create new jobs, homes, shopping, and many other new destinations close to transit, expanding the number of opportunities for people who live within a quick bus ride of light rail. New destinations near transit give more people the freedom to forego the costs of car ownership without foregoing access to jobs, education, health care, and community. In this way, the rezoning promotes greater social mobility and equity. Second, the sub-district boundaries and transportation network will create a contiguous mixed-use neighborhood around the station and on both sides of 15501. It will create pleasant streets, public spaces, and a variety of connected destinations <laughs> that will encourage people to walk, bike, or take transit, consistent with the comprehensive plan and with our com recently completed TOD study. Third, although zoning alone cannot solve housing affordability, it is foundational to supporting existing new and affordable housing near transit. The rezoning will provide new market rate housing to meet the demands of a growing population in a walkable neighborhood and taking pressure off of more vulnerable neighborhoods. It will result in new property tax revenue that can be used to support affordable housing across the city. 
and it will create a strong density bonus, especially in the Support 1 district, which makes up a majority of the rezoning, that will encourage developers to include affordable housing at Patterson Place. To conclude, the rezoning will lay the groundwork for a new Patterson Place, expanded resources for affordable housing, and shared prosperity. We believe it is critical to adopt clear and predictable standards now in order to set expectations for developers to ensure that new development is built in a transit supportive way, which will maximize the benefits of our community investment in light rail. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Savara. Good evening. Uh, Jim Savara, 1114 Woodburn Road in Durham. <clears throat> I'm involved in the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. Uh, and let me, let me stress, I've just had a chance to look over the material uh, briefly this afternoon, uh, but we're very, I'm very pleased uh, to see the attention that's been given to incentive, incentives for affordable housing uh, as, part of, as part of this, uh, of this plan. Uh, we know that, as the staff has indicated uh, long ago, talking about moving from the temporary density bonus uh, to developing the permanent uh, plans uh, for the station areas, it was going to be difficult to find the right number uh, to both have sufficient density to support uh, transit and light rail on the one hand, uh, but not so high that the density bonus was not an attractive incentive for them uh, to add 15 percent affordable, affordable units uh, as part of larger uh, housing developments. Uh, I think that the, the way it, that it has been done, um, I, we, might, we might hear from the staff later about how they picked the number of 30 as the maximum density in the, in the, center, uh, in the center district, um, but it looks like this is, this is striking the right balance. Um, it encourages higher density, which is good for the light rail system, as well as providing the opportunity uh, for affordable housing. Uh, in addition to the density, there are also the, the flexibility for height requirements uh, and uh, less, uh, less requirement for uh, parking spaces. Um, so I think this is, this is an, a positive step forward. We've been waiting for some time to see how this would be incorporated uh, in, the, uh, in the permanent uh, zoning uh, for the station areas. Uh, I think it was also useful to refer to the report of the Triangle J Council of Government and their recommendation uh, to include measures to promote the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, I would like to see more details. I understand that, uh, that planning by itself uh, will not be able to develop these policies, uh, but I encourage them, as they say in the presentation, uh, to continue to work with other departments and city government to create some positive and effective incentives uh, for maintaining affordability uh, in existing units. Uh, we need it not only in this station area, but throughout Durham. Uh, so we're pleased to see how the, uh, how the proposal has been, has been, has been uh, put together. I commend the staff for their effort uh, and uh, look forward to uh, a, a positive resolution of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one final speaker, Mr. Waldrop, who is speaking in favor. We did make a motion that each speaker would have four minutes at a minimum, but I don't know how much time we have left of the, the 15 minutes per side. So we did extend the, the public comment period since we had a number of folks who signed up. We said 15 minutes per side, up to four minutes. I don't know if the staff is. <coughs> You're at like eight and a half minutes that have been used. Okay. Mr. Waldrop, uh, and, and I know you had handed out some information in advance that's at our spot as well. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Mike Waldrop, 3524 Sayward Drive. Um, I'm happy to see that you're moving along a little bit faster than you had, had indicated. So I, I'm glad that I made it back in time. Um, I'm a sort of a low-tech person. I gave you materials that I, I wanted to... Um, used to communicate a few points about Patterson Place. I'd like to um, uh, start you with a big 11 by 17. Uh, that's, that's technically exhibit one. And it gives an overview of, of a message that I've been taking to all the transportation and all the land use planning people in, in, in that, that are involved with Patterson Place. I mean, we've had discussions about light rail. We've had discussions about 15501. 
And clearly we've had uh, discussions about compact neighborhoods and specifically Patterson Place. And what we have is a very unique situation here where we've got the main drag between Durham and Chapel Hill, between the two medical centers, the two universities, uh, crossing a transcontinental highway. And the four quadrants that we have, I think, have been, uh, that have been recognized by the consultants that came in and were generated, uh, generated the TOD guidelines for all the station areas. This is really an absolutely unique area in uh, the city and, uh, and town of Chapel Hill. And it is, I think, unique along the line, the, the light rail line, uh, as, as it's been mapped. Um, what I'm trying to, what I've been proposing is that we need to make four quadrants work. We need to have integration of four quadrants. And on that larger sheet, you'll see uh, images of two autonomous vehicles. Now, you'd have to be living under a rock not to believe that the, the whole transportation world is going through dramatic transformation. Maybe we're going to get light rail delivered in the mid-20s. And I think in the meantime, there are going to be just very dramatic changes in, 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 in various forms of technology. Everybody is scrambling to get into what will be the, probably the largest technological uh, revolution of, of uh, you know, our lifetimes. And so I have a vision of a shuttle line served by autonomous vehicles. If you see reference to Navia shuttles, uh, those things are running between the two station areas, between the four, uh, through all the four quadrants. And they, they would be supplemented by what I call the, the, the taxis. Now, these are vehicles that are actually uh, in production. They're in use. The shuttle that is shown in the upper right hand a part of that exhibit is actually something that is, is running on the Las Vegas Strip. So, you know, this is not a, a blue sky, pie in the sky notion that we could have a swarm of vehicles that could basically negate a lot of the distance issues, the hostility issues for pedestrians and bicyclists that, that are presented by 15501 by a very tightly integrated uh, mix of different types of, of uh, mobility that we, we, in many instances, can't really even imagine. So, in any case, that's, that's item number one. Um, to support that, because this is all rubber tired, I think we've got to get the streets right. And frankly, I think getting the streets right is probably more important than getting the zoning ordinance right. And so I'm very happy to see that, that um, the staff has, has picked up on some of the ideas and, and with some of their exhibits, they've, they've included connections that I'm showing on, on my big map. And uh, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> I don't have, even have a copy of my set. Could I borrow? Exhibit two, that was the base road network that I'm proposing. Um, exhibit three is merely the same base road network with numbers so that we could discuss these things. Exhibit four is an attempt to show that the northern corner of uh, the defined boundaries, what I've got um, indicated as PPCN North Corner, is really a particularly valuable part of the compact neighborhood because if the road network is built out the way it should be, then they get a straight shot via a new road that would run parallel to the light rail tracks back into the station. So service for them uh, could be among the best, and access for, for, for that part of the compact neighborhood could be among the best in the, in the, in the whole area. And it's, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the big map, it's, it's basically two shuttle stops away from the light rail station. Exhibit 5 represents one of my big questions about the staff proposal. Um, they have mapped the core area and with, their, with staff's mapping of it, they're, they're suggesting that the area that I've indicated with A in a circle is actually a, um, you know, a valid location for core densities. And yet, we have got areas directly across from the new station area, from the new light rail platforms. Uh, and those are indicated with numbers 1, 2, through 6. And they have 
despite their greater proximity to the station, I thought the whole name of the game was proximity, accessibility, and, and so on, they have been essentially demoted to S1. I, I have a big problem with that. I think that's, I, I'd, I'd like to understand what professional logic uh, has, has generated this map. Um, there are a number of smaller items that I'm going to be discussing with staff and, 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 and possibly elected officials as we head into the, the, the uh, further extent of the approval process. I am obviously thrilled that we've gotten this far. Um, I've got Exhibit 6 is, is a, a little bit of nitpicky edit, editorializing on, on their plan. Um, I'll let you examine these things at your leisure. Uh, obviously, we are, in my opinion, cooking the planet. We are going to be spending hundreds of millions of dollars per station area. We need to take the investment that we're making and totally transform this city. We need to have a transit-served, transit-rich city within the city of Durham and, and the town of Chapel Hill. And so we can argue about 15% or 25% or this or that, or, but what we really need is to leverage that investment. And we need to have diversity, we need to have a broad spectrum of uses, and we need to have density. And, and, and hopefully the light rail will then serve as a spine that will serve this area and everybody else. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. So we, th these are the folks in favor. So we used our full 15 minutes. We have four individuals who've signed up with either concerns or, or, or are listed themselves as against. And I'm just gonna call them in order as they signed up. We'll start with Reynolds Smith and then Beth Trejo and then followed by Bob Healy and John Kent. Good evening. I'm Reynolds Smith. I live at 1905 Old Red Mountain Road, Rougemont. I'm on the Durham Open Space and Trails Advisory Commission, and I'm chair of its Open Space Committee. And I'm here to talk about the so far huge unmentioned elephant in this room, the New Hope Creek Wildlife Corridor, which flows alongside the Patterson Place compact neighborhood, especially the northern tier where the Oak Ridge 58 property exists. Like every other citizen group and like everybody else so far, we also support these zoning changes. However, we prefer the 300 foot setback from the tier boundary that was originally proposed by the planning department rather than the 200 feet it now recommends. This corridor, the New Hope Wildlife Corridor, is a state-designated natural heritage area that connects many special habitats. It was created in the 1990s by four cooperating jurisdictions in one of the very first multi-jurisdictional open space agreements in this state. It has been defended against encroachments for over 25 years. Now it is being challenged at its most vulnerable, vulnerable point, and that is right where the 15 and 50 one bridge goes across the corridor, right where Oak Ridge 58 uh, is located. <clears throat> this is the narrowest point of the corridor. The corridor's ecological benefit is the connection it provides between numerous special habitats, and it is at this point that is most threatened by development. In July of last year, the developer of the Oak Ridge 58 property submitted a grading plan that would assault the corridor at exactly this point. Their plan would grade the slopes and remove trees and other vegetation to the north of the bridge. This plan conformed to existing legislation and so had to be administratively approved. But this plan gives these developers the now vested right to destroy the very features that the planning department has created these new regulations to protect. It's a dark time in the fight for the environment today. In the 1970s, at the dawn of the environmental movement, it was universally understood that environmental issues were first of all local issues. 
It was in specific localities where environmental problems existed that were found the most effective and efficient solutions to these problems. All that changed in 2010 in North Carolina. From then on, localities were seen as an obstacle and all that mattered for state government was protecting an equal business opportunity to exploit every locality for its wealth. If state government is now a chief environmental problem in North Carolina, this cannot be allowed to be a secret. If our rights to be the municipalities we want to be have been abrogated, this must become public knowledge. People will want to know that before the bulldozers and skid steers and loggers descend into the New Hope Canyon, our leaders first said, no way, no way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Trejo. Mr. Chairman and Planning Commissioners, my name is Beth Trejo. So I'm an attorney with Nelson Mullins. I'm here tonight on behalf of the group that owns the, the New Hope Common Shopping Center, with the exception of the Dick's Sporting Goods, which is a separate lot. And I sent you a letter so I wouldn't have to take up too much of your time tonight, but I do want to kind of hit the highlights for you. Um, um, my client is asking to be excluded from the zoning case. Um, the 15501 boundary, um, in our opinion, creates an obstacle that uh, is not conducive to the urban form that's mandated by the very prescriptive requirements of this ordinance. Um, in the future, there may be solutions to cross 15501 safely, but today there are none. There are none that are planned um, to move forward. Um, so the plan would be to dodge cars as you cross the street, to move through the mini storage <laughs> uh, and, and, and across the parking lot to the shopping center. Um, we think that doesn't fit. Um, and we would share with you, remind you, I guess, that the city um, you know, stands before you today as an applicant, just like any other applicant in the zoning case. Um, and we would ask you, and the city is bound by the laws just like any other applicant, and we would ask you to critically and carefully consider the rezoning that puts in place requirements on property owners who have expectations and previously approved plans that complied with the ordinance in place at that time. Um, I would tell you that your code says you're to consider compatibility with present zoning and conforming uses of nearby property and with the character of the neighborhood and the suitability of the subject property for uses permitted by the current versus the proposed district. And we would suggest to you that, that this is just premature in the location of the shopping center at the intersection of Highway 40 and 15501. Um, so we would ask to be excluded. I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Bob Healy. Good evening, I'm Bob Healy. I live at 839 Sedgefield Street. Uh, I have for uh, most of the last 27 years been either chair or co-chair of the New Hope Creek Corridor uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, and um, uh, the, what I'm gonna say is roughly uh, uh, consistent with positions of the Sierra Club, uh, New Hope Audubon, and the Durham Open Space and Commission. We have uh, been consulting with them. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when the weather was nice, my wife and I took a hike at the Johnson Mill uh, Triangle Land Conservancy Preserve, which is about two and a half miles up the New Hope from the 15501 bridge. It is uh, 299 acres. It is an investment of well over a million dollars in uh, state and private funds. South of it is the Duke Forest, a couple thousand contiguous acres. South of that is the Hollow Rock Park, uh, which uh, is another million dollars of public and private money. If you go to the bottom of the New Hope Corridor, above 54, you find Lee Farm Park. Another million dollars of federal, state, local money, private money. Uh, if you go north of there, you get both Corps of Engineers lands, big contiguous tracks, and you also get uh, the Chapel Hill Road Park, going right up to the bridge. Now the bridge really is, as Reynolds said, a pinch point between two enormous contiguous corridors that have over the last 27 years been put together at the expenditure of great uh, cost and treasure. 
The bridge itself, as a result, about 10 years ago, of a vote of every single one of the four jurisdictions, the, the uh, voting authorities, was raised by the state reluctantly at a cost of a million dollars to improve the connectivity of this corridor. Now, we have uh, consulted with six ecologists. These are people who have lots of experience. Three have PhDs. Uh, four of them have worked specifically in the New Hope for between 25 and 30 years. Uh, all of them really know the New Hope well. And their recommendation to me has been that A, all the slopes need to be protected. We think that the staff recommendation goes a long way toward doing that. And secondly, they say that at least 300 feet from the boundary Toward 15501, they say needs to be protected. Frankly, I'm not asking for that, nor the staff's asking for 200 feet. I'm asking for 300 as something where the values of the New Hope Corridor will, will be considered. Not a no build zone, and we have never, ever been density bashers. We think in this case, we, especially with regard to both transit and affordable housing, we shouldn't bash density. What we want is good design. What we want is a chance to have the project designed so that it does not affect the resources of the corridor. Now, we have had two negotiations with the developer about this. We hope to come to an agreement with the developer. The developer will not tell us what he intends to build. Talking to the ecologists, they say, look, it's not just about coverage, it's about light, it's about massing, it's about windows, it's about vegetation. And we think that this idea of you know, a 300 foot corridor in which a special use permit would be required with some added protections referring just to the New Hope plan are an appropriate solution to this dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. John Kent. John Kent, 394 Cub Creek Road, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I am, I have several hats in regard to the New Hope Creek Corridor and the Patterson Place Compact Neighborhood. I'm on the board of New Hope Audubon. I am a technical advisor to the New Hope Creek Corridor Advisory Committee. I'm a regular attendee of the Open Space Committee of DOST. Um, and I'm 28 years uh, doing Streamwatch monthly volunteer sampling on New Hope Creek um, from Stagecoach Road to north of Calvander in Orange County. Uh, what I want to say is, number one, I support the steep slopes proposal as staff has uh, proposed, and I uh, want uh, three, I uh, agree I strongly support actually the original staff proposal about the 300 foot setback from the edge of the 100 year floodplain. Um, I, I recognize that state law will probably not allow that, so um, I am willing to compromise to go down slope to the compact neighborhood boundary. Um, and I, I want to point out that this is a compromise a couple of times already on how much uh, setback is done. And I, and I want a setback, I, not a TUA, a setback. Um, the New Hope Creek Corridor is one of the best hardwood bottom lands remaining in the North Carolina Piedmont. You have to go all the way to Charlotte to the Adkin PD to get something similar. Furthermore, this is a pinch point in a regional uh, wildlife setup, which has, while it has intrinsic value, it has even more value because of its position as a link between very large areas of open space that we have. The Jordan Lake game lands and the Duke Forest connecting on to the Eno to the north. 
And um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kent. We're going to close the public hearing. That, that was everyone who was signed up. And we appreciate you working with our, our time limits on the public hearing. I expect we're going to have a lot of questions from commissioners. Uh, some of you may get called back up. So if a commissioner specifically asks a question and asks you to, to come back up, we ask that you, if you're willing, to come back up to the microphone and to help just answer that specific question as we have them. But we'll start to my right, Commissioner Morgan. Yes, I, I had some comments on the transportation plan from the last uh, person that rose up. Sorry, I forgot your name. Not Mr. Kent, but the, the one for pro for it. No, it was on the pro side. Oh, pro side. <laughs> Walter. Yes. Actually, I like your vision in, in transportation. Uh, certainly, I think a lot of the things with autonomous vehicles of taxis and shuttles, I think that provides a lot more vision. I'd encourage you to be part of that and any thoughts on that, because I know uh, that's changing rapidly, I know, from that perspective. Yeah, any comments on that? or well, Primarily because I, I see this as, an, as the antidote to the problems of, of the, the 260-foot and sometimes 310-foot uh, right-of-way for 15501. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the vision for 15501 is, uh, of, of converting it ultimately to a freeway, I think, is old 80s think. Mm. I think what we have here is an opportunity to create an urban node, even if it's just on the Durham side, but hopefully in conjunction with Chapel Hill. And I would hope that we would seek to integrate through every means possible uh, the north and the south sides, yep. and then across I-40 back over to, to the Chapel Hill quadrants. And I think that addresses some of the concerns about the New Hope Commons area and being able to provide access between the two areas. Yes. OK, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. All right. So I'll just start with two. Two questions, one for, one, one for staff and one for um, Mrs. Trios. So for staff, the, the comment was mentioned that by Mr. Kent that he didn't think that the state would allow for the 300 feet setback from the, the slope uh, drop off. My question is, uh, if the initial recommendation from staff was 300 and it went to 200, just can you, can you provide insight of how you got from 300 to 200, and can you provide any comments on, is it the case that the state won't allow that 300? Certainly. Um, so as we were drafting proposals uh, to bring out to the public and get feedback and then continue to refine the project, uh, one of the things that was uh, put out for public comment was the idea of a floodplain setback. Um, as we were in further conversation about that tool and consulting with our attorney, uh, we do not feel that we have the authority to do that um, based on the restrictions and environmental protection regulation that have been, been put in place by the state. So then we tried to do, uh, tried to figure out um, a mechanism where we could look at the use intensity adjacent to a use outside the tier, uh, an, a setting outside the tier that's very different from what's inside the tier and came up with a transitional use area mechanism. Um, at the same time, uh, so the 300 foot distance came from, uh, there's, there's a lot of literature about what um, the right distance uh, for different kinds of environmental considerations of buffer is appropriate. Um, and we've been presented with information from a, a couple of different sources of stakeholders in the project related to that. Um, the review of those materials showed, depending on what it is that you're considering, whether it's wildlife movement or it's stream buffers or things like that, um, the range can be anywhere from 50 to as much as possible. Um, but also looking at uh, the measurements or the, the discussion where the 300 foot distance came from was measured from uh, streams as opposed to floodplain. We also realized that in trying to um, administer uh, this regulation that we really needed to be doing so from a legally defined non-changing boundary. So we then revised our proposal to the 
200 feet from the compact neighborhood boundary because that compact neighborhood is based on existing easements um, or property lines or rights of way. So that was how we ended up there. Okay. Thank you. And so my question, um, hopefully my colleagues, are, my peers are asking some of my other questions. But my question for Ms. Trios, am I saying that right? Trejos, I'm sorry, <laughs> is you're asking for basically a carve out or exemption for, for your client, uh, the, the owners of New Hope Commons shopping complex. Um, and so my, as I look at what's proposed, my, my, the, my thinking is that this will increase the value of your, the owners of this complex just simply from a highest and best use standpoint. So beyond that, what do you see this proposal requiring you to do, say from a cost, added cost or whatever, that you would not have to do with this exit with the existing zoning that you have? Yeah. So their fear is with the really prescriptive nature, the you know, all the architectural requirements, um, the block perimeter. You know, if, if they're coming in, they may be required to um, upfit their project in a way um, that they would not be required under the existing ordinance. Um, so, you know, we've, we've talked with staff about what happens when tenants are being changed in and out as happens in the ordinary course of, the, of uh, a shopping center, you know. <laughs> um, and, and staff has said to us, well, you know, those things you would not require that you um, make changes to your, uh, to your shopping center. But that's not, that's not laid out precisely in the ordinance as we understand it. And so we're, we're concerned about that. We're concerned about... Um, you know, adapting small projects that are necessary to maintain the viability of the center um, and being required to build um, a very urban, intense uh, facility in an area that is not, uh, doesn't accommodate that kind of use as it exists today. Um, and, and so this, you know, this is a, an, an ordinance. This is not the comprehensive plan. Um, you, you know, the comprehensive plan can, can serve as a guide and it can be flexible and folks can come forward with zoning cases and say, you know, we, we know the plan says this, but, but there is no way across 15501 today and so we would like to do X. <laughs> um, here, if you put this ordinance in place, our, our, our clients, are con our property owners are constrained by it. It's the law. Um, and and um, it seems to me that if I if we were coming before you as a landowner making this proposal to you, given the circumstances of the, as they exist in this area today, that you would laugh at us. <laughs> um, that you know, this is not a walkable area, um, given the improvements that exist there today. Uh, and, and my client feels it's just inappropriate to require that they upfit their facility for something that doesn't exist. Um, so they would like to be exempted. Um, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I forgot to tell you how much I appreciated Lisa Miller's help. Um, I've called her probably 25 times, and she's been lovely. So um, you have great staff. <laughs> Thank you. I know that wasn't the scope of your question, but that was a lovely thing to say, so we'll accept <laughs> it. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, any I reserve any of uh, my just general comments to Lisa. Thanks. Great. And, and again, I will say, this is we are dealing with an enormous amount of information. We have three motions, so we are going to give this ample time. So if folks have additional questions or comments, we will come back to you. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Ms. Miller, the planning staff, all the people who provided input, and the people who came out tonight to speak. Uh, I really appreciate your effort. Uh, I also want to apologize to my colleagues because going through this has generated quite a few questions. I'm gonna to try to ask some of them. Uh, first question, I hope it's simple, but attachment A that came with us, there were three different numbers for the acreage of Patterson Place. Attachment I has a fourth number which is 603.28 acres. And all, the, all I want to know is, is that latter number, the acreage that's before us in the proposal tonight? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the gateway station area, uh, which is adjacent, will there be any compact neighborhood around the gateway station? 
Uh, I cannot answer that question uh, with any certainty, but I can tell you in the, in the conversations and the coordination that we have had with Chapel Hill staff in the planning department, um, that part of the work that came out of the TOD planning grant um, was to start drafting regulations for uh, the Gateway Station area. We have reviewed that draft form and there was a lot of consistency with our design district format. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the timeline of that grant project, my understanding is that they were unable to get to conclusion of that, but they're continuing to work on that. Okay, thank you. You might as well stay there. Uh, I would, the, the letter from Nelson Mullins, uh, we heard what Ms. Trejo said. Uh, it seems to me, and I'm not going to dwell on this, that you're being asked very nicely at this point to exclude the New Hope Commons area. I just hope you keep talking about it because I don't want it to get nasty. And sometimes when you're dealing with letters from lawyers, things can get a little, a little further along. Uh, I resemble that one. Though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that bothers me is the inclusion of I-40 in the area and the removal of portions of our major transportation car to overlay. I, I'm all in favor of having the compact neighborhood to support transit and everything, but I, for one, don't think we should be sacrificing our, you know, major transportation car to overlay zone in order to accomplish it. And that's, that's just my opinion. I do note that down the road, there are several uh, improvements proposed for I-40. Uh, uh, project ID 45-2 will add I-40 managed lanes from NC-147 to US-15501. And then somewhere further down the line, Another project will add I-40 managed lanes from US-15501 to NC-86. Both of these are considered regionally significant projects. Uh, and I don't know if it would uh, impact the design of the I-40-15501 interchange or not. But I would, I just don't think we ought to be infringing on, on the interstate. Uh, now, I have some questions about the split parcels that you talked about. Uh, parcel A and parcel B. Uh, I heard what you said, but it, it seems to me, based on the fact that the greater part of these parcels is outside of the proposed compact neighborhood, and that the portion that's outside does have environmental protections, why not just exclude these parcels from the compact neighborhood? Okay. So that was not uh, an option that we considered. Uh, the boundary, so the when the project that completed in 2016 that looked at the compact neighborhood boundaries and the transition from the suburban transit area to the compact neighborhood boundary, there was extensively, the area was extensively looked at for where the appropriate locations for this boundary to be. Um, there are definitely some difficulties in this area because there are some very large parcels um, that include land that is right up against roadway that's part, like an integral part of the kind of developed area, as well as going all the way to the edge of the New Hope Creek. Um, and so I will say that part of what was established in the Compact Neighborhood Report and part of the reason for including it in your packet um, is that, uh, again, making sure that we're using legally defined boundaries so that we have a clear edge of where different zoning regulations apply. Um, there were certain easements, there's a trail easement, a sewer easement, and property lines and rights of way that are used to draw the edge of that boundary. 
Um, and then there was some discussion about protection and increasing steep slope requirements for areas within that. Um, but the interest of consistency along the streetscape, uh, along the streets within the compact neighborhood, um, I think <coughs> that we feel confident that we can translate what is the current protection to maintain that protection without pulling any land out of the developable area under this vision for the compact neighborhood. Good. I, you know, I think as far as these areas have already been rezoned, you know, there's got to be well-defined property boundaries in the areas that have been rezoned. So I can't see that boundary would be a problem. Well, because part of the area inside the compact is inside that boundary and part of it is out and the parcels are shaped mm -hmm. very weirdly. But also any place that has, so there's a mixed use zoning and there's a PDR and leaving that kind of, particularly for the mixed mixed use piece, if you pull that parcel out, it's just a parcel with a restriction. Uh, and the mixed use area, all of the development has been built out under it throughout Patterson Place. It's part of a much larger project, so it's kind of a weird uh, piece, just kind of that that's a that's a messy situation that we want to address. Okay. Um, I've heard uh, several requests read several requests from several people wanting to see a 300 foot transitional use area. Uh, I'm not going to get into the legalities of it. I just want to state, as I told you when you gave your introduction, I prefer to see the 300 foot transitional use area. And I hope that we can do that. I think it offers a little bit better protection. Uh, I do have a couple of questions about transitional use areas. There are trees in these areas and places. Will those trees be protected? So anything that is proposed within that area would require to go through the major special use permit process. So the only way that those trees would be removed is if there's permission granted through that process that has those review factors that are related to that uh, applied. Okay, and the slopes that are internal, uh, steep slopes that are internal, I noticed in my driving around out there, the, those also seem to have trees on them, so I'm assuming those trees would also be protected. So many of the slopes that are internal, some of the things that show up on that map are constructed, which are exempt from protection. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there's a kind of in the southeast portion, there's a mm. stream that would have a buffer as well as I think a wetland area with protection. Yeah. So those standards are in place. Okay. Um, another thing I noticed in your table of uses, uh, all the residential uses have this L which I think means permitted subject to limitations. I'm not quite sure I understand that, but if I owned a single family home, say in, in District S2, should I be worried that something might happen that's gonna affect my home? So the reason, so, and this is a point that I think is important to convey. It's one that came up in, in the previous consideration of the text amendment that uh, Michael Stock presented to you all. The way that our regulations work is that if you come in to try and make a change, then the regulations apply. So in the case of an existing use, uh, there are, you know, that use can continue. The, the, there's uh, the ability for that use to change within the existing structure. Um, but once you come in to start making changes, then what we look at, if it's a, a non-conforming structure, um, which a single family structure may be, uh, then we would look at whether the proposed change be, makes it more conforming. That is the threshold. So it's mm -hmm. a pretty, uh, it, it's a pretty flexible, especially compared to the non-conforming use restrictions, um, which are a little bit more restrictive. Uh, then that is pretty, it should be a relatively easy case to make. Okay. Um, referring to this sheet here, uh, 
it seems to me that the core subdistrict is somewhat lopsided relative to the location of the proposed location of the station. And we already saw a proposal to maybe push it out a little bit. Uh, how, what does staff think about that? So we did slightly expand it based on public input uh, that we received to push it to the west. And I think part of the reasoning there is because there's existing development, whereas the area, uh, particularly to the uh, across Southwest Durham Drive, uh, south of the Ford dealership, there's not existing development on a large part, portion of that property. So pushing the core into that was not necessarily desirable. Um, again, our reasoning was really trying to keep the core small mm -hmm. um, in order to make sure that there is a large area in the support one where that affordable housing bonus had a, has a really big potential impact. Okay, a uh, suggestion that was made, I think, at your previous presentation was maybe shrinking the core area just a little bit and setting up a situation where you, because once we fix the core, it's going to be there, have a core, an area that could either be core or support one and leave it up to see, you know, what developers would bring in. And I've noticed this hasn't changed any from your presentation, so I, I take it that suggestion didn't go over very well. Well, what we're proposing is what was presented based on the public process that we put together. Mm -hmm. um, and we did respond to the input that we heard from the, the stakeholders that were involved in that process. That is not to say that there couldn't be a change, but from the informational item to the public hearing in front of you all didn't seem like the appropriate time to do something like that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a number of little nitpicky things, but I'm going to save them until later. <laughs> Great. Can't wait. Thank you. Commissioner Durkin. Sorry, you can, you're going to have to stay there. Okay. All of my comments and questions are based on the affordable housing component okay. with one related but non-density bonus point or comment, just there is a provision that says that um, payday lenders are limited in one section and permitted outright in the rest. And I would just like to voice my complete opposition to any payday lenders, um, especially when you're trying to make something like affordable housing conducive and bringing low income people to this area. They're predatory and should be not permitted at all, as an aside. <laughs> Um, so my questions on the affordable housing bonus, um, I have a few of them, but the first is, are these intended to apply to both rental and ownership housing? It's not clarified, but it's not clear that it would apply to both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then how, how would they be enforced? So that's something that, uh, again, we're working through with the Community Development Department. I don't know if, do you have any more specific information? We don't, do we have any specific? Hey, we are working with our community development department to come up with a manual for the enforcement guidelines for the affordable housing density bonus since it is actually in place already in, in the compact neighborhoods and, okay. well, actually countywide. Because there, there wasn't language in the proposed text amendments that would make it clear that they were tied to some kind of rules and regulations. And while those could change, I think it should be clear that there's something, an enforcement mechanism both an enforcement mechanism and rules to follow. So if it's ownership, maybe there's a deed restriction, or if it's rental, there's a lease rider and makes the tenants aware of the fact that they're in some kind of regulated state of being in their tenancy and have rights that they can enforce because otherwise people are just operating in a vacuum. Um, but you don't have, to, I don't think you have to describe those in this text, but it needs to link to something where it's clear that there are rules and regulations. And I don't think it does that right now. I believe that it's in the rig, the 6.6, 6. 6. 6, the affordable housing density bonus section there does lay out what the city can do to enforce it, okay. which is probably not included. It's in the code, but not in the handout. Okay, yeah. got it. That's good to know. Um, and then one thing, really, 
kind of to both any new development that would occur, but also the existing naturally occurring non-regulated affordable housing. How is there any, how do we know that people who are actually low income or under 60% of AMI going to be the renters? Because while the rents could be lower, that doesn't mean that the tenants are actually low income. So it could be higher middle income people benefiting from lower rent, which I don't think at all is the intention of any of this. Right, so there's nothing that we can do to regulate that, obviously, with the naturally occurring affordability. <clears throat> um, however, if we were to be able to, to preserve that affordability, then that would come with the income restrictions that are also in place for the anything that would be created under the affordable housing okay. bonus. And I guess, are there... There was mention of incentives to preserving, preserving the naturally occurring affordable housing, and is there any movement on what that looks like? That, that has not been fleshed out enough to be able to tell you this is how we do that, but it is something that has been discussed uh, quite a bit as, a, as an important um, priority for not just our transit areas, but in general looking at the areas where there is naturally occurring affordable housing that that's a great opportunity and a lower cost opportunity mm -hmm. than creating new, the new development providing those units. I think my last question is uh, how long the regulatory restrictions or restrictions in general would apply to housing created under the bonus structure. <laughs> 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to echo Commissioner Brines. Thanks to everyone for coming and for the comments. We got a lot of good feedback. We have a very big packet. Um, and I want to especially thank Lisa for the staff report. Um, it's, it's comprehensive. And one of the things I appreciated about it is that you, you note that there will likely be some negative consequences, potential ne negative consequences. So I'm going to ask you some more about that uh, and kind of follow up on Commissioner Durkin's questions about housing. So I'll start with something that struck me, and I, I you know, some of this I, I mentioned last time. Um, on page seven of the report, you say that the current proposal allows, right, 145 feet of height by right in the core, but with the by right densities that you have proposed, you say that this approach will likely encourage more non-residential development in this area. In, in close proximity to the station, right, in the core. So can you say more about that? I want to hear kind of your take on it before I... Sure. I think that it's more... Um, so as you're looking at the compact neighborhood as a whole and what the intensity regulations are, both in height and density, by having a relief from a suppressed height that requires affordable housing to allow greater height, then that would allow the non-residential uses in the location that we want them to be at an intensity that is greater than what is allowed by right elsewhere. So it is not necessarily saying you have to put office here or encouraging office there, but it is, uh, it is creating a situation where you're going to be able to get greater intensity of that use um, within the core. Okay. So let me ask you stay, to, to stay on this. Um, I think Mr. Hikes, is that right, from Go, Go Triangle, spoke in favor of, of this proposal, but you also wrote a letter to us uh, from Go Triangle that I think the suggestion from Go Triangle was that this, the densities be higher. Uh, so I think in the core, they suggested 35 to 45 units per uh, acre. Um, and then S1 and S2, all of those are higher than what is in the uh, is in what you're proposing. And can you so can you say more about that? Because that's also that applies to S1 and S2. Yes, uh, I'd like to hear. Um, so the feedback that we have received uh, related to the bonus has been very interested in keeping those de by right densities low. And so what we did is we. Uh, reached out to the TOD planning consultants uh, that were, uh, Go Triangle was managing that grant process, asked them to help us. It's 
very hard to define what's the minimum transit supportive density. Um, but we asked them to, using their national expertise, help us answer that question. Um, and what they came back with was about 25 units per acre within a quarter mile of the station. So that was kind of where, how we ended up at lower numbers than what Go Triangle was looking for. Okay. And again, there's a lot of different things that go into mm. what supports transit, looking at what your parking policies and parking pricing looks like and a whole host of other things. But that was kind of their best uh, boil it down to a number. Okay. So it, I guess what concerns me is that the core right now as it, as it is currently is relatively you know, new commercial um, and a lot of asphalt and parking. So there's, and, and I guess I'll, I'll ask the question that Mr. Waldrop had, which is why not extend the core, you know, northeast of southwest Durham? Because that, I mean, you said that there's vacant land there. I, I would think that you would want to have some core there uh, to, to promote, uh, I, I guess what I'm worried about generally is that we are, and by your own admission, that we are potentially encouraging commercial in the core and hoping that residential will go in the S1 and S2, right? But, but S1, you know, parts of it are more than, you know, half a mile away from, I mean, just kind of looking at the, you know, quarter mile, more than close to half a mile away from the station. One of the things we got uh, feedback on is that people are more likely to use transit if they're within a quarter of a mile. And so it seems to me like we're creating an incentive here for commercial, and I'm not even sure if we're creating an incentive for office in the, in, in, in the core um, and having residential be a little bit further out. I, I don't, I, I guess I don't quite understand the logic of that, especially if we are trying to get people within a quarter of a mile. So my understanding is different from yours okay. in that the quarter Good. of a, not the quarter of a mile, the six, there's a 600 foot area where office uses, uh, places where people are going to jobs using the transit to get to jobs is an important area for office use. And then the area within a half mile of the station is the area that is typically used as this is, a, this is the area within which we create transit-oriented development in order to support the transit. And that the residential uses are, you're going to get more ridership from residential users that are further from the station because, uh, again, the proximity of your job to the station is more important for choice riders than it is for having your residents that close. But that court, there, that half mile area is the area that's kind of defined as the, the walk shed um, the 10 minute walk for that area okay. to the station. Thank you. Um, so is there no reason to require particular uses? I mean, if, if, we, if we want a good mix of these things, res residential, office, and commercial, there's, can we not require that? Can we not require mixed, you know, require mixed use or something in these zones or? We could require mixed use, okay. um, but we are going to, so one of the things that we're trying to balance with the design <coughs> districts, um, we are create. so I guess to take a step back, certainly form-based districts in general are moving away from dictating use in order to, to focus on the, the, um, the way that buildings are interacting with the public space and creating environments that are positive for people to be in. Um, we have never done a, sort of strict form-based code where we divorce use from those form standards um, and don't have intentions to do that. But um, one, of the, one of the potential criticisms, um, which you heard from uh, the representative of one of the current uh, property owners, is that regulating the form and the streetscape and design elements is very restrictive. So when you take your typical land use, uh, your typical zoning of commercial, there's not a lot of restrictions on what you can't, like what your building has to look like, what the public space around the building is, that there is public space around the building. Um, and we're putting a lot more emphasis on that. So 
in order to, in some respects, it's offsetting some of that where we're allowing greater flexibility for your interior space. Um, and if we start getting into a particular required mix of uses, um, we already know that there's difficulties in getting financing for, it's more difficult to get financing for mixed use projects than it is for single use projects in most cases. It's more difficult to get developers to want to do those things. Um, and so adding those two things together uh, seems like it would be a concern to actually get implementation of this vision that we have for how this place changes. Sure, thank you. Um, so, I am concerned about this because I, I think that we are potentially creating some unintended, or we don't know what the consequences of this will be, especially on housing, both supply and affordability of housing in this area. And I, if you look at the two reports that we got, attachment A was from a few years ago, and it looked like, I mean, roughly speaking, there were 30% of units in this area were affordable to 60% AMI or, or less. And if you look at the more recent numbers, it's seven and a half percent are affordable to 60% AMI and less, or, or uh, less. Now, uh, you know, can we do anything to stop that? I'm not sure that we can, but I am concerned that we're going, you know, we don't know what the consequences are. We may be encouraging more commercial here. We may be encouraging people to build uh, nice apartments that are not going to be affordable at all. I, I am really, I, you know, to com uh, Commissioner Durkin's point about how can you how can we preserve the naturally occurring affordable housing units? I, I'm not sure there's anything in here that does that, and it's it's possible that we're going to have the the opposite effect. Um, you know, I looked at some of the you know we got our tax valuations recently, and I looked at some of those around there, and you know they have gone up considerably. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how that will factor into rentals and all that, but I. I'm, I'm really concerned, and, and I guess my, um, you know, my big point is that, you know, so from the ex expanding housing choices report, we saw that the biggest shortage is for small units, is for, you know, w you know one unit, um, or, you know, one or two people, and I'm not sure that we are creating those kinds of, or potentially incentivizing these kinds of residential units in this area. Um, I'm, you know, my, I guess my big, uh, or what I would like to say is, or what I would like to see is for us to really study the effects of this a little bit more. Um, I, I'd like to point out, I know this is, it's hard to get exact numbers on, on what the effects of this will be, but I, I'd like to point out that, you know, just a couple of months ago, we, we passed an amendment that said, if a neighborhood proposes an NPO, the staff will look into how that would affect housing supply and all that. I think we should do something like this, like that for this. You know, we should really assess what this is going to do to affordable housing in this area, what it would do to supply. Uh, I know there's a lot of moving pieces, but I think if we go through with this, we're likely, you know, we're creating a policy that's at odds with what the city, the city's stated intent is to create or to have 15% affordable units around transit stops, and we are already lower than that. Um, and I, I, you know, my gut tells me that this is just based on the fact that people, developers have not used the density bonus very much or at all. Um, I'm skeptical that that is going to change in this case. Um, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to promote, again, more commercial or redevelopment. So, I, I, you know, I'm going to vote no on this. I think, you know, the last case that we had on landscape and trees, I had hesitations, but I voted in favor of it because it's, I thought it was in the right direction. I'm worried that we're, something this big, if we pass it, we may, the consequences of it may, you know, be negative in a way that we can't undo. So I, I'm, I'm going to vote for, uh, against it and, and urge you to do the same to my commissioners. Thank you. Vice Chair Hyman. Yes, uh, I have a question uh, for uh, staff. Uh, a part of a, a presentation that was made to us uh, indicated that a number of clients within this compact uh, district want to opt out or be exempted, you know, from uh, participation. And I, my question to you is, under what circumstances could that happen? So we have... Uh 
some pretty substantial comprehensive plan policies get, as well as direct uh, work program and uh, direction from our elected officials to pursue putting design district uh, zoning in place in the compact neighborhood tier. That is not to say, obviously when this goes to council um, for the rezoning for their action, they have the ability to, to modify that. Um, but we feel like there is substantial um, direction to continue on that front as well as substantial justification for why it should not be detrimental for that entity, it's one entity, uh, to be uh, part of this district. Um, so there is the possibility for council to make that call. We don't feel that there is a, a good logical argument for why we should promote that. Okay, and the other part of my question would be um, allowing an entity to opt out. I mean, what effect would that have on the greater project? Um, so I will say that with the, so one of, one of the important things is that the street network is kind of looking at this entire area as well as connectivity across Interstate 40. Right. Um, that network applies to the compact neighborhood tier, not to the zoning district. And so it would still be applicable if the property was removed from the zoning. Okay. It would be a lot harder for us as that property, if that property redeveloped, we don't have the same street standards, uh, like the street designs in place outside of design districts. Um, and so there would be some, some issues with continuity and kind of creating that um, more multimodal, human-friendly street network that's such an important piece of this project. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna start with some of the technical things. On page 16, where we are looking at 533I, to E, and we're talking about drive-in windows, and it says any speaker systems associated with a drive-through facility shall be designed and located so as to not adversely affect adjacent uses. I don't think that's an enforceable standard. That is existing language that's repeated. I realize that. I don't um, think it's an enforceable we can standard. We can work on some modifications. I think it that. needs to be a little tougher, even if, if it needs to say where it could be located or something, I don't know. But I, I think that that doesn't quite make it. And I had the same criticism when we did it the first time. Sure. Um, as I'm whipping through here. So now I'm on page 24 and I'm at 1613D, no, excuse me, C2B. And so we're talking about exemptions for buildings with one or two dwelling units. And I look at the exemption in A, and that's a sentence. And in B, it's not a sentence. I noticed that earlier today. Okay. <laughs> um, and just to be clear, those exemptions are related to requiring a non-residential use on the ground floor. And that's not clear from yeah, the way that... I'll make sure that it is clear. But we still... And that sentence... It should be a sentence. sentence. Thanks. And then... My biggest concern out of the way everything is drafted is, not, is we're in the transitional use area, which I actually, as a result of your presentation, have a much greater appreciation of than I did when I was just reading this and trying to reconcile what I was hearing from the community mm -hmm. about whether this was the way to go. I get it now, but I still think that we've got problems and it needs work. So. We have factors, not standards. They are statements of, they're essentially not even sentences. They don't express policy. In other words, it says preservation of tree cover. And we've, to, have, to what degree are we in favor of it? And then the standard is essentially is adequately addressed. Well, adequately addressed is not a standard against which a legal standard which, against which performance can be measured. 
when you go to the Board of Adjustment, it's okay to have leeway, but it's got to be a standards-guided decision-making so that if I go to the Board of Adjustment and I'm turned down, I can go to court and say, you know, the standard is this, and they clearly didn't follow the standard. This doesn't have a, a standard, especially in five. It's other review factors that aren't even named uh, are adequately addressed. I just think that we need to say more specifically what we want out of these standards. What's good that we are looking for or what's bad that we want to avoid in, in how we develop inside the TUA. And so I can't vote for this until this is fixed. I would like to be able to vote for this, but uh, if we are just going to, if we're going to push it through tonight, then I have to vote no. If we could delay this for a little while to while we could tighten these standards up and make them, especially standard number one, really get at what the advocates for the New Hope Creek Corridor are trying to protect, to give to send a clear signal to the development community and what they should be proposing for a use permit. And then also the, the decision makers, and since it's major special use permit, I'm assuming we're talking about council, and I've always had some misgivings about conducting quasi-judicial proceedings at the council level. Is that still the difference between major and minor? I would be much more comfortable in sending it to the Board of Adjustment. That's the only difference. Uh, but, so, but I leave that to you and to, and to my uppers on the city council. Uh, but um, I would like to have stricter standards that tell the people who have to follow them what's good, what am I supposed to be accomplishing? And if there are more of them or if they are written longer, well, perhaps. Uh, that doesn't worry me, but it's adequately addressed isn't good enough as a, as a legal standard, um, in my opinion. Now, if I could just, we can certainly, uh, I'm not saying this to say that we can't modify the language, uh, but this language was drawn from the major special use permit section of the ordinance that exists using some of the language from the review factors and beefing it up. So I just wanted to put that out there. Ooh, but, and it's still, a problem. I'm not I've been you're complaining wrong. about I'm just this for years. Letting you know where it came from. Um, I have lots of concerns, and I've expressed these for a long time. I was very involved in the development of the Ninth Street Design District, which is the only non downtown design district that we've got. And we did a lot of things that were right, and we did a lot of things that, in my opinion, were I wish we hadn't done. We did some things wrong. And we did some things that worked out okay, but it wasn't because we, we shaped it or planned it. And uh, based upon that experience, I think we do design district planning incorrectly. And I'm not talking about the public outreach and bullying. All, that's good. I think that for each design district, we need to create a design district plan, which then gets put into the comprehensive plan. And in it, we should lay out the goals of the design district. In it, we should draw the map and say the initial rezoning for the design district zones will, should look like this. And then say, but then as the design district develops over time, identify, say, possible expansion area for core, possible expansion area for Support one, possible expansion area for the design district, and say, draw dotted lines outside. And then say, but for these expansions to occur, these are the things that we would want to see happen here. We, and that way, it could start with a small core. The development community could look at the comprehensive plan and say, well, I wish I had, the, I own the support one property next to the core. I wish it were core. And so we could look in there and say, okay, this can be core if, if the project he brings in, say, with a development plan, because you can have a development plan with design district zones, and you, we can then shape our design districts grow. We, the way we do it now is we throw it on the ground and we hope that it all turns out right. Let's not do that. I, I don't see any reason why we have to. We have comprehensive planning. We can 
use a comprehensive plan to say this is our these are our expectations for design districts start small give away the core give away some support one but then say to expand it these are the things we want and then we can shape how it grows project by project that's the way we ought to be doing this and i feel strongly about it i wish we actually did it a little bit with ninth street because we adopted a plan and then we adopted the text ordinance and then we applied the text and we did that in stages over over months um, I would like to do that as we move forward because we have lots of these to do and they're hard to do You're, you've been doing the work and I appreciate it um, I want to talk about affordability uh, because I attended it's been years ago now but it doesn't seem that long ago because what was said was so true I attended a JCCPC meeting and people from the planning staff with interns you had interns one year and you said go out and find places where uh, our affordable housing dense where affordable housing density bonuses are working and find out why there's work in our stuff and they came back and they said two things one is you got to have a three to one or four to one ratio for the bonus and the other thing is is that you can't already have development limits that make that disincentivize and so we are finally doing that here by dropping that height in support one down to 45 that's bold and i think it's great what is the height limit in support one in ninth street don't know offhand <laughs> See, this is license to make something up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot more than 45 feet because that's the height limit in support too. <clears throat> uh, and we're building, and we know that the real limitation in the way we, we build residential, dense residential projects isn't the zoning code. It's the building code. It's the, how much wood frame you can put on two floors of, of concrete podium. We know that. This drives, this, so it cuts under that and, the, and it no longer is what controls what developers build we, we now have zoning back doing it again and this is a good thing um, one of my concerns though about this design district and the way we've done all design districts is is that people slip in and do rezonings up underneath them just as we're pu pulling the plans together so first of all we've got a lot of relatively new commercial old-timey commercial strip shopping centers it's just this district is flooded with them and they're not going to go away there you they have lots of useful life there and the people who are not going to say oh goody we can do more we already have the example of one who says not who would like to be able to continue to develop the old way um, and I worry that it'll that it'll be so long before we see redevelopment of the existing commercial in this particular design district that a lot of the plans and policies that we're making today and just throwing on the ground are not going to be relevant at the time redevelopment begins to occur. That's why I like this planning idea better because we can continue to mold and shape and what have you. We don't have to go back and recapture what we've already given away. It's easy to relax the code. It's hard to make it stricter again. Um, so I wish we were doing it that way. Um, but I do like the boldness of actually adding that in that other component. Make your, your affordable housing bonus more liberal in that, in that you drive the ratio of, which, is it now three units? There's, so by removing the density limitation, you, like, you're not then still restricted by a number of units that's then gonna drive the size of units, but you're actually removing the Right, right. So it's just it's just a height bonus. Yes. So uh, whatever you can build within building code and the massing allowed with that overall height is what your density can be. Right. You can go up in height, but you still have to include a certain number of, of yes. units in order to build to, yes. to exploit it. Yes. The other thing is, is we've removed all other incentives. We no longer have, you know, when the when we did the, the Ninth Street District, there were all kinds of of density bonuses there was one for public art what I called the concrete seahorse density bonus the um, we fortunately got rid of that but um, so I think this is good I think the core is still too big simply for this reason is is that 
once you give somebody core, it, it, it's, you've given it away. We're, we're done, zone, zoning is over for that piece of property forever uh, because it's our most permissive zone apart from what we have done in the Research Triangle Park, which I was against that too. So. Um, So there's so much about this that I really like, and I would love to fix it and vote for it. Let me ask a question. If I understood you correctly in response to the questions that some other people were asking, the, the city's legal people have had trouble with the idea of, of, a, of a setback from the edge, some, some defined edge or reasonably defined edge inside the New Hope Creek corridor. So, well, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But so we went to the transitional use. If the transitional use was distance was 300 feet instead of 200 feet, is there a legal problem with that? No, that's my knowledge. If we did that based upon, because I know that when you pull together all the people who are stakeholders and what have you, kind of a compact is formed. And when you start messing with it, then you're messing with the kind of agreement that people came to, the consensus. Would people, would there be a state, an identifiable stakeholder group out there that would howl? So I would say that the reason that you heard what you heard from folks who came to speak tonight is because there's not 100% agreement that there's, there's, that distance, is there's still some disagreement by the various parties. Is it possible to have it be 300 feet near the pinch point that has been identified and maybe 200 feet further away where the, where the corridor is much wider? Potentially. In other words, but, but that's essentially a mapping exercise. That's not impossible. Uh, and then finally, I have a lot of sympathy for the New Hope Commons developer. It's not a form of development that I like very much, but I buy the argument that right now there is one vehicular crossing there. There is no, there is no pedestrian crossing that I would want to do. When I have my sign out and I'm collecting coins, I don't cross that street. Uh, it's scary. Um, and if we make it a divided, um, a, a limited access highway and we separate the grade at that point, which is a currently one of our plans, I think it even gets scarier because I do occasionally walk Hillendale Fulton, which has ramp, all kinds of ramps coming together. And there are cars coming from lots of different directions and they are looking to, to exploit vehicular opportunities and they're not thinking about me as a, a pedestrian and it's scary. I have always had some misgivings about whether or not everything on the other side of 15501 from Patterson Place ought to be involved here. Um, right now, we have one property owner who's on the northern edge of this district who would like to be opted out. I do not see why letting them out uh, it affects the integrity of what we propose for the district, and also what we propose for the larger area in, term, in terms of connectivity. Um, so I would like to, re to really consider that, unless there are stakeholders that, that feel like somehow letting that New Hope Commons shopping center out of there is, is going to mess up the plan of salvation. Um, and I'm not suggesting this because I believe we shouldn't rezone something when, when a property owner doesn't like it. I'm, but I do, I am sympathetic and I want to look at the reasons, for the, the, when they complain, I think that we have to give the, the reasons for inclusion stricter scrutiny. And I am swayed by not all the arguments that Ms. Trejo listed in her letter, but certainly the first couple of them resonate with me. And so I would like to delay this so that we can have better standards and that we can look at the width of the transitional use area in a way that responds more effectively to the concerns of the New Hope Creek corridor. I have Hildegard Riles somewhere back here, just have to be able to go home, face her. Um, and then 
and then also talk about the situation with uh, Ms. Trejo's client. I would love to have 60 days to look at those things and see if we can have better standards, uh, better transitional use area, and a more effective ultimate boundary for the stakeholder property owners involved. So at the appropriate time, I'd like to be an opportunity to make that motion. And we will come back. No, no. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to just hear now, before we continue with additional questions and comments from staff on, on that, that notion of a 60-day or a 30-day continuance, I'm asking now because sometimes motions get put on the table and seconds happen and things move quickly. What is the staff's take? Are there specific issues we need to understand? I'll say that our resources are limited with what we can work on, and so if we delay the 60 days, we're delaying every other project we need to work on 60 days. And We've been at this for three years. Thank you. Additional questions and comments. L let's start here. Let me. I'm going to start with the commissioners who haven't had a chance to speak yet, and then we'll circle back. So, uh, Commissioner Kenshin. Uh, yeah, I want to first uh, commend staff. This is actually um, outstanding work, and I know how hard you guys have worked. I'm always impressed by the our professional planning staff. So, another great job. Um, I worry though that we're. This is very good. And I worry that we're letting the, the perfect be the enemy of the, of the good, of the very good. Um, and I would caution the commission not to do that this time. Uh, and I'm taken aback by something that Commissioner Al Turk said, too, about affordability. And, you know, being someone who advocates for affordable housing, I would be really upset if we were uh, doing something that was going to be against affordable housing. So I'm curious as to what I know. Um, I don't know if Dr. Savara is here on behalf of the coalition for affordable housing and transit. But I know they worked hard, and I, I respect the work that they do and, and their opinions. I'm just curious as if they've got um, a position about, um, again, I don't know that we, that we know. We don't have a crystal ball to know exactly what's going to happen. But I'm curious as to if, whether there's any kind of um, indication from you all on whether we're on the right path um, and to, to have what we, uh, anyone, I'm not sure. I'm just calling on Dr. Savara, but anyone. Well, and I would actually say, I appreciate your direct question to Mr. Savar. I actually would rather not have a question of anyone here to answer the question. But Mr. Savar, if you are willing to offer your thoughts to the question. It, it, okay. And so uh, for those watching at home, there's been no group discussion yet uh, from an affordable housing okay. standpoint. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours, Commissioner Kenshin, if you have additional. No, questions. no, that's that's it. I just think that, um, again, I think I love the density bonus, and I think that it could work. I think it's a really good shot. Uh, we don't know, uh, but I think it's the best, like Commissioner Miller said, it's a really good shot. Um, and I like this one I like to see us take. So I'm, I'm going to be voting in favor of this. I know it's not perfect. Uh, I don't know that it ever will be perfect, despite how many hours and how many years I think you said you worked on it, three years. But I think it's very good, and I'm going to vote in favor of it. Thank you. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes, ma'am. I, I do appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I'm still kind of on the fence, though, as to uh, with, with, the, with the New Hope Commons side. Uh, I, maybe you can clarify it or, or clear me up some, but it's, just suppose something, uh, if, if we did approve this, and, uh, and and New Hope Commons was 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 still was included in this, and something happened as such as happened, you know, in Raleigh 35 years ago in a tornado or a fire or something, and uh, a lot of those businesses are really damaged or destroyed over there. Where where are they put them at? At ground zero of having to start and go back to comply? I just I, I'm I'm really confused on that matter. Sure. Um, so we have. Uh, had, as, as Ms. Trejos mentioned, had several conversations about this property and her client's concerns. Um, one of the things that we have made sure is the case as we put design district zoning in place, we understand that it's going to create nonconformities or, or in some instances continue nonconformities and make more aspects of the property nonconforming. Uh, and that's why we make sure that we have nonconformity provisions that can address some of those situations. So with this uh, particular site, the New Hope Commons site, um, nothing about this proposed rezoning would create a nonconforming use. 
um, the uses that are there are allowed under the provisions of what we have proposed. In addition, the current zoning of that site is commercial center, um, where the, uh, I forget the exact word, but the, the primary use has to be commercial. Right. Whereas the design district zoning actually allows greater flexibility in what uses you can have within that existing structure without having to make changes to the structure. And then if you do want to make changes to the structure, then the um, litmus test is are you becoming more conforming to those new standards than you were before? So you just have to demonstrate that you're moving in that direction. You don't have to comply. You don't have to build under these rules. You have to show that you're coming into greater conformance. And then in the situation you mentioned where a destruction of the, the structure happens, with a non-conforming structure, you are allowed to reconstruct without a minor special use permit process, just a by right process to the existing or the previous footprint. Okay, well, I feel better about that than my, but my, <clears throat> also, as Mr. Miller said, my one of my biggest concerns is I would feel much more comfortable with the 300 foot buffer uh, in the creek area, and if it could, the, the, the uh, borders could be set back, but the, the area closest uh, uh, to the creek area, I, I really feel that should be a, a, a 300 foot buffer, and I, I'd feel much more comfortable with that. Thank you, Commissioner Hornbuckle. We will circle back for additional comments. Uh, We'll start at the end just for my sake and keep it easy, Commissioner Morgan. Okay. I have just a couple comments. Um, just listening to this, I think there's just certain areas that I think really I you know appreciate what staff's done and putting this together. I think we do need to tighten this up a little bit more in, in those areas of certainly understanding, looking for ways to bridge to, say, the New Hope Commons, uh, being able to do something in considering how we do it. I, th I think of like the North Hills area in uh, Raleigh where they have ways to get across that busy street uh, in Six Forks. I mean, I think there's some things that could be done better there that we could incorporate into the plan. Um, yeah, and those are part of that 15501 corridor study that's ongoing right now as yeah. improvements to that. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think there's ways to do that and expanding the core is, is one area too and being able to promote more, I guess what I'm thinking, we talked about mixed use, being able to provide more people close to the, st uh, to the station as well as have commercial use as well. So I do think there's ways to try to improve it. I understand the concerns and comments made about uh, it may be more restrictive in getting financing and other things like that. But anyway, my, my impression right now is it does need a little more tightening, a little more tweaking to this before we can move forward with this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Bryan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll try to go through these things fairly quickly. Page 16, uh, number 2B at the top. drive through facilities shall only be permitted for bank or pharmacy uses. Anything wrong with fast food? So we actually don't allow drive-through facilities in any of our other design districts. And this provision was a response to specific feedback from the stakeholders in this process for those particular uses. Are you going to restrict the number of lanes? That was a, I got your email and I appreciate that comment. We have not incorporated changes based on comments from that, but that's certainly something that we can look at incorporating into that section. Okay, because as I pointed out, uh, a lot of bank drive-throughs, you might have three lanes that where you can get service from the bank and a fourth lane for an ATM. So, you know, how many lanes are we talking about? Uh, on page 17, uh, just in front of outdoor recreation, this county only, within the SRPC district, the following shall apply. That's just a, a num because the renumbering okay. is included that's, just for that purpose. That's what Apologies for any confusion with the excerpts. On page 18, uh, item number four is you coming down the page and then further down, item number five, its phrase starts in the RR district. 
Okay. Is that correct? That is an existing provision that is in place, yes. Okay. All right. I didn't write that one. <laughs> that was a little confusing. You can blame Mike, maybe. <laughs> that, that's, that's a, that maybe. one was a little confusing. He might be older than when he was working on these. Uh, and uh, page 28, uh, item number C3, you say open space amenities. Are you sure you don't mean public space amenities? Thank you for catching that. And uh, other two comments I would make. Uh, I also think that we need a little bit more time to digest this and maybe polish it. I agree with uh, Commissioner Miller's comments about having more better enforceable standards, for example. I think, Is it UA? Uh, yeah. I think, you know, we need to spell some more things out. And I'm also, I don't know that we can do anything about it unless we have more standards put in place at some future time. But I am also concerned about the affordable housing situation. I agree that we might be doing something that is not what we really wanted to do with the way it stands now. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Durkin, thanks for being patient. One question related to the New Hope Commons development. There was uh, mentioned that there were upfits that would have to be made based on this change, but that I just want to make it clear there is nothing that they would need to do That's to their right. current structures. Okay. Yeah, there's un until somebody wants to make changes, and again, changing the uses inside the structure so long as those uses are permitted, which again, this would expand the allowable uses. That can occur, but if there are going to be changes that they propose to the building and site, that's when the standards start to kick in. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, quick question. Lisa, you mentioned stakeholders, and I know you've been working on this for a while. Um, have any affordable housing advocates been part of this process? I mean, uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Kenshin meant, you know, asking for, for input. Have you gotten input both either you know, positive or negative on this? Yes, uh, we have had, um, and I don't know all of the members of the Coalition on Affordable Housing and Transit, but I know at least one other of their members has uh, has showed up and been involved in our um, public meetings and showed support for this, um, as well as other folks uh, in their uh, responses to the proposals at those public workshops and, and outside of those responding positively to the proposal. But nothing since we've gotten the, like the full draft or, or anything That includes from, with okay. the full draft. So the last public meeting that we had um, was in October of last year before we started uh, preparing the items for the adoption process. And uh, that not only had, it wasn't just concepts, it was the full draft text at that point, which hadn't, hadn't changed from the concept that was provoked uh, provided at the previous meeting that we had heard support for and again had support for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Additional comments or questions from commissioners? I do want to just reiterate before we have a motion, and Mr. Gibbs, I, I will recognize you as well, we really, uh, even if we are voting tonight for or against or to allow additional time to tighten this up, we really appreciate the, the exemplary work of the staff. This is very hard stuff. And um, I understand the challenge of putting it off and some additional commitments that that might entail. But, uh, but I also think it's important to, to get it done fast, but to get it done right. And so I, I've heard some good comments that I, I think we want to take under consideration tonight as well. Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, just, just a few comments. Uh, uh, I, every question, uh, and statement that's come from uh, this commission tonight indicates, and, and it's my feeling too, we need more time to study. Uh, and I think staff maybe uh, could benefit from whatever input uh, from, from us, from other bodies, other people. Uh, 
when this thing started out, I, I was at a meeting last night, and I, uh, I mentioned, I made a, a comment that this, and it was about the light rail. Uh, the light rail started out as a transportation project, but it has evolved to a development project. No matter what anybody says, that's what it is, and it is probably can be considered as both. Uh, but just a comment, for instance, uh, about the affordable housing. We have had issues with trying to set an affordable housing plan or requirement or whatever it can be called for years uh, just in the city the same process is going to occur uh, along these rail stops and in Patterson Place and in other areas. So we can't expect, just because this is on a light rail line or has uh, access to it, it's not going to settle the issue we're still going to have the same problems to try to, to work with, to come up with solutions for. Uh, well, that's just my frustrations. Uh, and I think we've, we've all said enough tonight, and, it's, uh, and I do appreciate what the staff has done. Uh, Lisa, I... She'll, she'll appreciate this, uh, you have given us another Bible. <laughs> and thank you to you, to all of the staff. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, Mr. Commissioner Chairman, Miller. if it's at the appropriate time. I don't see any additional comments. Uh, I do see Just staff to, willing. I want to reiterate, reiterate one more time when I say other projects will be delayed. I mean the new comprehensive plan will be delayed by two months if you, you, you all vote to, because that's, that's our trade-off. Okay. That, that's important to note. Um, I, what I do hear, though, from the Planning Commission is a general sentiment saying, we're not saying to start over. We're recommending to hone in on two or three specific areas that we believe would be important. And I say that because uh, I, I don't want the guilt hanging over us for two months of the comprehensive plan being set aside if what we're saying is we want to make sure that we have a little additional time to understand the affordable housing implications, even though we've done a lot of work there. We want to look at the, the pinch point of 200 or 300 feet setbacks, mm -hmm. and we want to allow additional conversation around the New Hope Commons question. So, I, I mean, is that is that accurate, that if we're saying these are the three things we'd like additional time and energy on that the comprehensive plan just I sits in the parking lot for two months? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lot of work with my, <clears throat> one of my primary resources that would be working on the comprehensive plan. I think that's something you could certainly put in your comments as to explaining your vote. Uh, that stuff will definitely get worked on before it goes to city council and county commissioners. If we have those comments tonight, we can provide that to them when we do our uh, work session presentations in March. Um, just be advised that uh, if it's not just two months, it also means that two months from now would put it at the June City Council meeting, which is a budget hearing, so it would mean it would have to go to August, so it's effectively four month delay. Um, so just want you to keep all that in mind before you vote. <coughs> right, thank you. I think Commissioner Bryant. Um, I understand exactly what uh, Scott is saying, but my only counter argument is, is that I believe we need to take the time to get this right. Commissioner Miller. So, Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, continue case TC 18 quadruple zero nine until the commission's regularly scheduled meeting in April. Uh, and during that time, it is our hope that uh, we can get the staff to look at and revise uh, potentially the following items. One would be uh, the width of the transitional use area, 
um, from 200 to 300 feet. The second one would be uh, tighter and more enforceable standards with regard to the issuance of use permits inside the transitional use area. The third item would be the advisability uh, of excluding from the proposed design district the property that is the New Hope Commons Shopping Center. And then the fourth item um, you may have to ask for some assistance on is uh, concerns about affordability, especially with the, is it the size of the core or? Um, for those of you who are concerned about affordability, what is it that you want staff to look at? Well, I, I need more time to think about that. So, and I'm not. I'm going to vote no on the continuance. Side. I leave it to others if they want to. Oh, did you you yeah, mentioned they, affordability? No, oh, and, and and I I actually might recommend that just for for ease of this vote that. We, we understand the intent. If you're voting for it, I believe there are just a few items that folks on this commission are hoping right, we might so. tighten up and address, but it may just be. So I'll stop at those three items, and that's my motion. Second. Second. All right, well, that is properly moved and seconded. Before we vote, I do want to allow time for any discussion. And to be clear, if you think we need to vote on this this evening, whether you're going to vote up or down, you should vote no on this motion. But any discussion? Commissioner Alturk and then Commissioner Bryan. Yeah, I, I mean, I will vote no on the continuance because I, I think, you know, it seems like staff doesn't want it. Uh, they, they are. I know you've got a lot on your plate right now. Um, I'll be voting no if we um, vote for it tonight, but I want to at least give staff the, um, the option to just go through with it. So I'm voting no. So the good news, you're voting no either way. So. That's right, yes. It's an easy <laughs> vote Excellent. for me. Yeah. Commissioner Bryan. I'm, I'm just feeling... Yeah, I'm, I will vote yes for the continuance. Uh, if I have to vote up or down tonight, I'm also voting no because I think it needs more work put into it despite all the work that's been done. And in addition to, you know, I know Mr. Miller listed a few things. I, I'm going to just go ahead and send some comments to staff anyhow, things that I've identified that I hope they can look at if we do continue it. And Commissioner Johnson? I just want to be on the record to say that I I'll vote no for the continuance because uh, and because I'd rather just vote tonight because I'm going to vote no as well and not doing this because necessarily staff is overwhelmed. I'm more of a you do it right rather than can you do it right you actually do it light you you do it wrong you do it long so it may <laughs> be the case that the, the city council has the same concerns and vote it down and send it back so it may still be on a, a delay. And so I don't think that taking the considerations of the time constraints, if it's not where we feel that we can get it, and I don't think that this is a function of uh, allowing the perfect to be the enemy of good here, but we've identified where there are opportunities for us to really do better. You know, you don't have to get it absolutely right to get, you don't have to be perfect to be good. And so I, that's, I'm gonna vote no, because I think there are opportunities to improve it to a point where you can satisfy all, almost all of the concerns. I don't think the affordable housing thing is gonna be solved with this, just given what we're trying to do here. Uh, but beyond the, the other concerns and issues that were raised, I think that they can be addressed and you know, time constraints shouldn't limit us from doing the best that we can to create a product that works for Durham and the people who will directly and indirectly be impacted by it. Great, thank you. Commissioner Durkin. I'm also voting against the continuance, I think. We were able to make a, a vote and reflect our comments in the comments section and have that pass on to council. Great. And Commissioner Gibbs? Uh, and my, my approach is from the other direction. I'm going to vote for this with a whole bunch of notes uh, as cautionary, uh, as things to be uh, questioned, explored. And if it doesn't come from city council or county commissioners and whoever else gets to review it, that's tough. And Commissioner Miller. Well, the reason I put the motion is I want to vote for this. We, we need a design district here. We need a good design district here. It should be reviewed by 
this body and I would like to have us have an overwhelming majority voting for it when it goes to council so we send a clear signal rather than 10 different sets of comments and signals. And if it takes 60 days, then, and I realize resources are limited and those things, but I think we need to get it right and we need to pull together and work, work together. I don't think any other body's going to give this at the decision-making level, the degree of review that we have done. This is a great planning commission and we need to take advantage of, of what we have to offer. And I like it when we send strong signals rather than a whole bunch of mixed signals, which authorize the people who get the signals to ignore them. Uh, that's why I would like to have this be better. I, would I don't want to vote no on this because we've got to have a design district. <laughs> Uh, very brief, Commissioner Gibbs. I, I just want to comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with the comment. I know I'm supposed to address you, but that me that messes my mind up. Anyway. He's listening, uh, too. <laughs> uh, the bodies that this goes forward to we're the planning commission. There should be communication back and forth on something like this, on anything that is of importance. Uh, we can't just operate in a, a vacuum from each other and just scribble a few notes and say, here, y'all settle it. Uh, and I guess what I'm saying is, uh, on this and on anything from this point forward, there needs to be organization as far as uh, their questioning us, conversations with us, our conversations with them. I find out a lot of information from them too. Uh, maybe that would muddy the waters, I don't know, but I do think there needs to be a more cohesive approach to uh, settling issues like this. Uh, I don't know of anything else the staff can do except for whatever they're instructed to do if they've got the time and, and their bosses are not us, it, but it is the council. And so that's, uh, that's just my thinking on it. Thank you. So the question before us is a, a two-cycle continuance with specific uh, areas we'd like to address, and we'll ask for the roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. No. Commissioner Alturk. No. Commissioner Hyman. No. Commissioner Busby. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Kinchin. Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Yes. Commissioner Gibbs. Yes. And the motion passes seven to four. Great. Thank you all very much. We have uh, just one question under new business, but there may be other items and for staff to address. Two other items that go with this item that you right. probably need to take action on, and unless we want to say that, um, that took action that for all three. Mr. Chair? Okay. Commissioner Miller's motion for continuance, I thought only covered TC 18009. So oh, sorry, staff just was talking that since they they have to go together, that they'll have to continue together and track together. So all, all three motions will we'll need to track together. We'll, we'll, we'll just combine them. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Okay. Miller. That was my intention. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure that was your intention. Yeah, that was my intention. Okay. Great. So, so to just say that on the record, the motion that was approved by a seven to four vote was a two cycle continuance for the three items that were paired together. Right. Great. Thank you. Are there any other staff updates? So I, I did not provide an. And, um, and may I ask if if you're may I ask we're still not adjourned. So if you're having excuse me, excuse me, sirs. Mr. Healy, Bob, and, and sorry, we're still meeting, so if you can go in the hallway, that we appreciate it. Thank you.
Um, I, I did not provide uh, your what, what to expect next month report because I'm still trying to flesh out one of the cases of whether or not it'll actually happen next month. But by the end of the week, you'll get that via email. Just wanted to let you know. But mm -hmm. and, uh, um, With the one thing that we've gotten a lot of emails back and forth on is the expanded housing choices. Does staff have any idea when that might come to a that, shit? That was why I didn't provide your um, update for next month yet. I'm waiting to hear back on that. So hopefully we'll know something pretty soon. As soon as we know, we'll let you know. Well, thank and, you. And I will note that while we were meeting, I was not checking my email. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at my email to reference which well, case you, exactly. needed to, you needed to recuse yourself from. But we did get an email from, from the planning director, Pat Young, that that did, if I understood it correctly, and yep. someone correct me if I'm wrong, that his recommendation is that this will be, the, the uh, expanding housing choices proposal will be in front of us at our next meeting, and that then it is our determination on how this moves forward. And the mayor replied to that email and said that, that he agreed right. with that plan. The mayor, I thought, I think it's the last I heard, it was still with the mayor, and he's trying to do have some communications with others. There were emails during. Oh, there's the more. I didn't. When I was recused oh. myself, I looked at my email okay. and saw that. Yeah, I apologize. I was too busy doing other things. You're doing your job. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll send you the list regardless this week. How about that? That's great. Any other any other questions or comments? We are adjourned. Thank you all. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.